Good evening. We're going to call the Town Council Committee of the Whole meeting to order for Tuesday, March 26, 2024 at 6.33. Um, all are present except for Councillor Merritt and Councillor Parker, who is going to be running late this evening because she is um, doing council duty at TVCCA. Um, we have calendar and communications. Um, Councilor Bordelon. Um, thank you. Um, first, I just would like to, uh, at some point, maybe we should consider a moment of silence for that collapse of that bridge. And um, it could have been you know, drastically worse than it was if it wasn't for the um, uh, traffic control that you know caught that message uh, that happened today in Baltimore area so just very sad I have a lot of friends that live in that area that you know pass over that bridge to go to work um, and so I just think as a community it does affect us and it's going to delay a lot of ship shipments and um, things like that so at some point I think we should consider that um, you know uh, I guess I would ask now if we could have a moment of silence for all that are involved with that bridge and the tragedy um, from the boat to the first responders to the people that are still missing, if we could. Thank you. Um, my communications start with I, you know, I attend St. Mark's Church in uh, Mystic, and I did attend Mr. Splain, the former Groton Town Councilor, um, 100th birthday celebration. It was beautifully done by his son, who is a choir director um, up at UConn in stores, and he brought former UConn and current, as far as also ledger and former ledger alumni choir singers to sing. It was beautifully done. I also attended the um, Mystic Irish Parade Foundation fundraiser at the uh, Velvet Mill, and it was um, a lot of different raffle items and different things. Um, that was a good way to kick off. Uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade. I did walk in the St. Patrick's Day Parade with several other counselors, several other dignitaries and elected officials, um, and a lot of other great organizations that were represented throughout the whole parade. And it was nicely put on and a huge turnout. Um, so it was almost, it, the rain ended and the next day the sky opened and it was wonderful to be able to have um, you know, mild weather, weather for that occasion. I also attended the uh, Fitch High School uh, cheerleading squad um, were, you know, the winners of the state's tour tournament, and they had a fundraiser as well, so I attend that. Um, they had beautiful things that they were raffling off and trying to raise money for their next adventure, um, so that was uh, really um, good, and I think those are my only many communications about SP Butler, um, concerns with um, property reuse, concerns with some people reached out to me, you know, not understanding the motivation for the letter sent to planning and zoning. Um, as I stated, I abstained. Um, but, you know, what's the motivation? More understanding needed on the direction of 20 acres to five, along with, you know, uh, increasing uh, modular home structures. Uh, people were just confused as to how that would look. Um, I think that is all that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Pacino. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I got all the same correspondence that uh, everybody at this table has received in emails, and you certainly don't want to hear about my day to day, so I have nothing else to pass. Thank you. Councilor Ross. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I met with um, two residents regarding the sale of town owned property. Um, I attended the guest presentation made <coughs> by Carolyn Wilson of Ledgelite Health District. Um, on Mad Power of Parents and Project 21 Overview. Um, I attended that with Councillor Jones. Um, I highly recommend it for parents of teenagers um, on how to discuss um, the use of alcohol with your children. Um, and that is available on GMTV. So if you have the opportunity to watch that, I, I highly recommend it. I was able to attend the Riverfront Trivia Night. Um, always good to, to uh, support Riverfront. I also walked in the Mystic Irish Parade with Councillor Bordelon, um, Mayor Franco, Councillor Jones, Councillor Gajewski, and Councillor Parker. Um, and I want to say congrats. Um, I also received 
the same various emails regarding reuse of the school property, support of budget items. Um, and I want to say congratulations to um, Chief Fasaro and the Town of Groton Police Department on their Kalia, I was going to mess that up. Kalia accreditation. So congratulations. I know that's not easy. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I also, along with uh, all the other councilors here, um, attended the Irish, the Mystic Irish Parade. It was a terrific turnout by Stonington and Mystic residents. And uh, also thank you to um, Representative Congressman uh, Courtney and Senator Blumenthal for attending, and it was very nice of them to come down. Um, <laughs> along with um, Councilor Rusk attended the gas and MAD um, presentation on, I think it was last Thursday. Um, they also have, if you want, for parents, an excellent um, uh, guide on how to deal with alcohol issues and parenting. So I think I recommend that anybody who has those issues might be a great place to look. Um, and I also attended or received this, the different various emails that everybody else has um, received. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor McBride. Thank you. Uh, a little underwhelmed. Well, I apologize for not being there, so I'm going to defer my report until next week. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Gajewski. Uh, just uh, a quick update. Uh, the clock via my phone is not working this evening, so I will be using a remote. So it will be a little bit delayed, um, just so the mayor knows. And then um, I also, I, on Sunday, I walked in the St. Patty's Day Parade, as previously mentioned. Um, Children First Groton will be having their second community cafe of the month. Um, it is at Thames River Magnet School from 5.30 to 7 p.m. The topic is mental health. Um, child care is provided for those who need it for the first 25 necessary. It can be found on their website. Um, and then uh, about two weeks ago, I attended a, um, I served on a panel at Fitch High School um, talking as a, talking with fellow recent graduate, relatively recent graduates about uh, the process to applying for college, and it was good to be back at my alma mater. That is it for me. Thank oh, you. and congratulations to the police department on their accreditation. Julia Parker has arrived. Okay, Councillor Parker has arrived at six forty. Councillor Parker, do you have anything to report? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, I attended the trivia night held by the Riverfront um, fundraiser, and I have walked in the parade with all fellow counselors and other dignitaries, and I went to the TVCCA meeting this evening, and energy assistance program will be receiving some supplemental energy assistance program money so people may be receiving a four hundred ten dollars for crisis benefits uh, i also found out that the moratorium that eversource held is going to end may 1st and if people still need energy assistance uh, to contact tvcca um, Good news, child, our child care facility will be receiving $2 million from the Community Investment Fund, so that will help with the building. So thank you to Representative McCarthy and Representative Conley and other representatives for their assistance in that. Um, TVCC attended a public event of ribbon cutting for the place for community well-being in New London, and let's see what else. Oh, they also received uh, attended the Sea Course Subaru Share the Love check was presented to them this past Friday, and doo -doo -doo. that's all I have to report. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I also received numerous letters regarding the budget, SB Butler School, and other topics. Um, I will speak regarding the letter to the planning and zoning for myself. I had brought forward requesting mobile home parks and the, uh, asking planning and zoning to review those. Um, my intent to bring that forward had nothing at all to do with the SB Butler property. 
and the requests that were put forward were, have nothing at all to do with the SB or pro property in my viewpoint. Um, this was more or less brought forward because our council has said that affordable housing in Groton was one of our goals and a priority, so that's why it was brought forward. Um, and it was also in the housing study and that's what was passed to go to the town council for approval. Um, I forwarded two sponsorship requests that I received um, from a counselor and from a resident to the government EB li community liaison, Mr. Ross Giofrido. I also marched in the parade with many uh, elected officials. It was a wonderful event. Um, I'd like to thank Councilor Parker for representing the town of uh, the town council and Groton at uh, the former mayor's um, 100th birthday party that um, Council Bordelon had mentioned, um, Mr. Neil Spillane. And as she read the proclamation, and I would like to thank you because I heard it was a wonderful event and um, you did a wonderful job, so thank you. Thank you. I met um, a volunteer for Groton Community Meals, Ms. Leslie Web Westhaver, and she shared that the Groton Community Meals just went underwent a strategic planning process, brought, bought a few food truck with the help of the ARPA funding, and they've recruited new board members and are planning to celebrate their 10 year anniversary this year. Uh, this organization provides food for members in our community who may have food insecurities. Ms. Westhaver has asked that we, the council, um, could help spread the word and, use, and potentially use our social media presence to help Groton Community Meals, and I know many of you already do. Um, we had some unfortunate news. The restrooms, the public restrooms in Mystic were vandalized. Um, I believe the sinks and the toilets were in the men's room were smashed over the weekend of March 17th. There is a video, I guess, of three youths um, that were seen leaving the Mystic Public restrooms between 1 and 2 a.m. with wet feet, and the police were investigating. In anticipation of the Mystic Irish Parade, the public works, they hustled and installed new sinks and toilets, and we have a new CIP for a locking mechanism to auto-lock the doors in the evening is being requested by the town. And, but we'd like, I'd like to thank the Groton Public Works for getting the restrooms in working order for the Mystic Irish Parade because that was a huge necessity. Uh, the police chief forwarded a wonderful letter from the Groton, uh, Groton resident praising Officer Potter and Farnsworth for their ability to use skill, skilled crisis intervention techniques which made all the difference while dealing with um, a person acting very erratic, and the resident praised the officers for their professionalism and compassion. I'd like to thank officers Potter and Farnsworth. Um, another uh, police department happy note was the town of Groton Police Department has passed CALEA accreditation, um, and it was an extensive accreditation process. Um, being accredited shows that our police department demonstrates a professional excellence in policy and practice and once accredited, the process does not end, and it is a continuing quest for professional excellence by working towards compliance with all applicable standards, as well as any future standards put forth by CALEA that may be applicable to our agency. The accreditation is awarded for a four-year period, and our police department is required to maintain continuous compliance during that period. The CALEA is a gold standard of professional public safety, and congratulations to the Town of Groton Police Department. We also received a very happy letter from Pequannock Bridge Fire Chief, Room, I don't know how to exactly say his last name, Room. Um, so let me read it very quickly. Uh, Jeff Room, Pequannock Bridge Fire Chief, stopped by, actually it's from John Burr, excuse me. Um, Jeff Room, Pequannock Bridge Fire Chief, stopped by to let me know that due to our budgeted fire pilot, they are lowering, lowering their mill rate. It's going from 4.1 down to 3.7, which is the lowest rate in over 15 years. And he asked Mr. Burt to pass, on, pass this on, um, pass on his and the Pequannock Bridge Fire Department Board's appreciation to our council. And that's what I have for today. I just have a point of information or a yes. question. Um, regarding the bathrooms, um, what time will they be locked? Yet to be decided. Okay. Um, uh, we were thinking maybe from like midnight to six. I talked to Bruce Flax, the chamber director. He said this is common. He said he sees them usually more around nine or ten start being locked. Um, you, know, you know, obviously not till for a while after the store is closed. But if you're out there later, you probably have access to a restroom in the restaurants and bars. So I, I'd want some input from the council before okay. we decide. Yeah, I think that'd be great because I know we did have someone come before us complaining that there were people urinating at the condos over there. 
and there wasn't enough restrooms at the um, other bar or restaurant. So I just get concerned that, you know, the access, but I do think it needs to be monitored. So I appreciate that. I look forward to having it come before us. And just mention, we had the same thing happen a few months ago there. So. The vandalism? Yeah, so we put in like a heavy duty metal sink. They had to have got on top of it and jumped up and down to tear that off. <laughs> Goodness. Okay, we're gonna move on to approval of minutes. Councilor Parker, would you like to move the motion? Uh, one moment. Sorry, wrong page. Um, I was reading ahead. Make a motion to approve the Committee of the Whole Minutes uh, meeting of March 12, 2024. I Second. so move. Moved by Parker, seconded by Rusk. And we did receive the uh, uh, minutes separately, so if we want to take a few moments just to look through them, if you'd like. Um, as um, Ms. Hilton is out of the office at this time. Okay. Okay. Let's bring that to a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I'll abstain because I didn't have them ahead of time. Thank you. And McBride. Councillor McBride and Councillor Parker, I would like, um, just because you're remote, can I ask you um, to state your, uh, Councillor Parker, are you in favor? Aye. Councillor McBride? I'll abstain just because I wasn't able to see them. Thank you. For my own fault, because I'm not there. Okay. That'll be six to zero to two. Moving on to new business. We have our first item is 2024-248 Police Substation Lease, 99 Gold Star Highway. And Councillor Gajewski, would you like to read that motion? Certainly. Motion to recommend a resolution approving the Town of Groton enter into a lease agreement with 99 Gold Star Highway owner LLC for a police substation located at 99 Gold Star Highway. Second, Bordelon. Moved by Gajewski. Seconded by Bordelon. Hello, would you like to introduce yourselves? Hi, uh, good, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Chief LJ Fazaro. Joining me today is uh, Attorney Eric Callahan. Uh, good evening, Eric Callahan from Sussman Shapiro. I'm one of the attorneys that serves as legal counsel to the town of Groton. Thank you. Would you like to give us a laydown of what's going on? Certainly. Um, well, last year, we were approached by the new owners of uh, what was uh, formerly the Groton Motor Inn, uh, a company called 99 Gold Star Highway, purchased that property with the intent of converting that from a hotel to uh, residences, to, uh, single, you know, one, one room, two room apartments. As part of their business plan, as they articulated it to me, is they like to partner with the community and, um, and, and part of their business plan is to locate um, some office space for the police departments of the host community uh, to conduct somewhat of a community policing effort. They offered to give us space in there. Um, we certainly were open to that suggestion. I discussed it at the time with the town manager. Uh, it seems like a good fit for us at a very low cost, uh, a nominal $100 a year for 10 years with opportunities to extend that. This would be a great chance for us to network with the community further. We've had networking offices in the town at various locations over the years. Uh, during my tenure, it's been almost exclusively in downtown Mystic at the um, uh, location that we have there next to the bathrooms that you discussed a short time ago, as well as we've had it in Navy Housing and we currently, um, uh, or we have it in, uh, we had it in Quantic Bridge. We no longer have those locations, but it's certainly something that we can benefit from. It would be a a platform for our officers to stop in at at various times of the day. They're not intended for processing criminal prisoners or anything like that. It would be merely a, an opportunity for an officer to have office hours. Our community policing unit would certainly take advantage of it, uh, designate certain hours of the day when people can come, much like we do at the library right now where people can come meet with an officer and maybe even meet with Officer Chase. Um, but, but certainly our patrol officers would take advantage of it as well. There'll be parking spaces. 
um, desk area, uh, minor uh, office equipment, that sort of stuff that our officers would be able to utilize while they're on duty. Um, and, and I think it's a win-win. I think it benefits them, clearly, by having a police officer presence there from time to time. Uh, but it certainly would benefit us because there is a lot of activity in that particular area of town. We, we investigate a lot of larcenies, shoplifting, traffic accidents. It would be a place where an officer wouldn't have to come into the police station to necessarily get his paperwork done. They could do it there. But they'd also be a presence where people can see the cruiser out front, come and talk to them. Maybe if they have some in information about incidents we're investigating or concerns about different things going on in that particular section of town, they could come and talk to the officers about it. So again, I think it's a... I think it's a benefit to us, should the council feel it's uh, a benefit to the entire community, then I'd certainly encourage you to, to uh, uh, authorize the town manager to sign this lease. And as far as any questions about the lease itself, you know, certainly uh, Attorney Callahan is, is well prepared to answer those. Okay, great. Councilor Portaline. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm in full support of this. I think it's you know a very low fee for a, a good effort. Um, I guess we could talk more about the details of the agreement we're going into. That's hopefully that's sound. Um, but from my standpoint of living here my entire life, um, and I'm not going to name anything in particular in that area, but I am very aware of a lot of sex trafficking, um, a lot of drug activity. Um, there's a lot of hotel motels up and down that strip. I've seen people stumbling out of them. My friend has even helped someone get to safety coming out of there. So I do think um, there's been some suicides, some overdoses down there. I do think on that stretch, um, it could be, I mean, we are in you know the casino area and we are between Boston and New York and there's a lot of activity. So I do think that we could benefit from having some type of presence, um, especially in that transient area over there on that, that one strip. So, um, so just from my basic knowledge of knowing um, and seeing actually, you know, um, what's going on i've driven down that way coming home after you know a late marching band competition and have seen a lot of different things just from a by bystander who's not out late happened to be passing off the highway at 12 o'clock in the morning um, and and have heard other stories from other people so um i guess i would just ask the chief for sorrow i mean when you said activity these are the things that i was thinking of is um, you know, I've heard, you know, they've, they've, they've rescued a young girl out of there one time that was underage, that was with a, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a suspect of sorts. And so, you know, I, I think this could help. And that's, that's my question. I agree. Um, certainly, if anybody has information or if they witness anything that they think is untoward or if they feel like someone is being held against their will, then we certainly, are, we want to hear that. We want to know that. We'd investigate it. But having... Um, several hotels in the area you know this is the midway point between New York and Boston and we do have some hotels in that area you know that's that's certainly something that maybe this might have a positive impact on but um, any investigations that we undertake regarding that sort of stuff you know clearly that's if they're open investigations I wouldn't be at liberty to discuss them anyway but but certainly having a presence I think would benefit us in so many different ways and I I, uh, I think it will be good for the town yeah I mean I think that's um very important and if you have you know a concern in a certain area i think having the visibility um not just from the community policing standpoint point but from for eyes and ears you know it's it's a major intersection off the highway um and having officers that could you know have different abilities to access whatever they need in that area could be very beneficial so um uh, as far as the contract i guess to you know to the attorney what what can you just kind of go over that quickly Sure. Um, I envision this lease as very low risk to the town. Um, uh, the, the town is renting the space for $100 per year, plus it's pro rata use of any utilities that it consumes. Um, it's a 10-year term with the option to extend it for two additional 10-year terms, so you can get up to 30 years, but you can terminate it upon 90 days notice if you no longer want to use the premises. Um, the landlord is providing some fit out, a full bathroom, six personal storage lockers, four external designated parking spaces for police visit, uh, vehicles and uh, visitors to the substation. The police can use it 24 hours a day and um, it has an outside entry so the, the police don't need to walk through the common hallways to access the unit. Um, the landlord will provide uh, 
for janitorial services and garbage, uh, a dumpster. The town's not responsible for any real estate taxes, um, obviously. Um, and, you know, I, I don't see really any real risk with, with renting the space. The, um, the maintenance and repair, uh, the major maintenance and repairs are on the landlord unless it's caused by some sort of, you know, negligent conduct by the town. So I don't have any concerns with it. Yeah, thank you. That's kind of what I read as well when I read through it. It seemed pretty straightforward, very minimal amount, um, pretty much nothing, um, and uh, gives us a lot of access and ability. So, um, yeah, I think that's great. And I just, you know, I'm happy to hear that, you know, this is a well thought off document. And, and uh, thank you to the... Um, owners that are you know going to be opening up there that they are interested in doing this i have seen this a lot out in california where a lot of uh apartment complexes do this because it helps with the safety of their own community so it's a it's kind of a partnership um where they have that asset and then you know when you have a larger complex to have that kind of joint effort so um, i think it's a great opportunity and i think it's on a well needed side of town where we've had a lot of activity a lot of concerns and uh definitely um could be beneficial so i look forward to seeing how it Rolls out. Thank you. Councilor Gajewski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just one quick question. I'm not seeing it in the, um, the agreement. What happens if the LLC owner um, sells the property? Is the contract still binding with the new owner? Yeah, so it would apply to, um, to successors of the owner. All right, that was it for me. Thank you, and love the building. Uh, Councilor Pacino. I had a couple of questions. The budget question was answered. The attorney sitting next to you, that was answered. Uh, but the attorney did mention that uh, it has an outside entrance, mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to walk through the common spaces. But is there another exit in an emergency? Can you get into the common spaces? The, the low, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the layout of this building. They used to be, the, yeah, it's, it, it, they're outside entrance and exits. Um, so I anticipate that it would just be that one entrance. Okay. Um, yeah, they haven't done the refit yet. So there's probably some some changes that will happen along the way. But it's, um, you know, they, they exit to the outside parking lot currently. So I expect that they'd be somewhat similar to that. Okay. I'm sure whatever, whatever yeah, clearly whatever applicable codes I'd be concerned yeah. with, you know, somebody with nefarious, nefarious ideas. Uh, you might want to go the other way for a time. Yeah, again, we're, we're not looking to house prisoners or bring anybody in like that. You know, that would be a risk to others if, uh, um, as I understand it, and, and again, I haven't seen their latest revisions to their, their plans, but uh, I believe it's an entrance exit right out onto the, uh, into the parking lot. Okay. You're safe with that? I'm safe with that. Councilor Rask. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chief, for bringing this to us um, and for the explanation um, to both of you. Um, I'm definitely in support of a police substation. Um, I think it's a great part of town to be bringing the police into. Um, I always support community policing, and I think this is a great way to do that. A um, couple quick questions. Does the town own the current building that the substation is in? The town? No, we do not. No, so it's leased. Is it a similar? Oh, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. You're talking about this building? No, the current substation in Mystic. Does the town own that building? It's leased, yeah. It's leased. Is it a current or a, I'm sorry? It's leased from the art museum. Okay. Is it a similar um, agreement? Like, a... I, to be frank, I'm not sure of that agreement. I, don't, I wasn't a party to those discussions when they took place many, many years ago. I, I think that they're probably somewhat similar. That would okay. be my guess. I think it's more vague in that one, though. In the, uh, it's been in existence for quite a while. Mm -hmm. You know, since however long the restrooms have been there, too. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so, couple concerns. So this is a property that doesn't currently have apartments. They're renovating it. What happens if that doesn't come to fruition? We suddenly have a police substation in a building that's pretty much vacant. I suppose that's possible. I don't think that would be in their interest. I, I think they, they want this occupied, that's their plan. And I think they've been, you know, I've seen some designs when we first met 
Um, the representative showed me a lot of the, the plans from other locations around the country, and they've been they've been wildly successful. And I know with you know a lot of increase in workers at Electric Boat, and I think it would probably cater to that clientele. But if if someone if it weren't fully occupied, we are entering into this agreement, and so long as they own it, I certainly defer to council on that. But I think we'd be we'd be okay. Yeah. So. Um the term of our lease starts when the landlord gets a certificate of occupancy for the work it's going to do. And if for whatever reason they don't, uh, they don't finalize their own project, we can get out of this lease upon 90 days notice. And it, it's, um, it's no real risk in, the, in that regard. Okay, so that was my other question. Um, the term is 10 years, but um, 2C says Basically, we can terminate the lease with a 90-day notice. Is that after 10 years, or is that during that 10 years? It's any time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think most of the rest of my questions have been answered. It's a long document to read. Um, nope, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you want to speak again? No, I was Councilor McBride's hands up. Okay. So. Councilor McBride? Thank you. Excuse me, thank you. I was I lost internet for a minute or two, so I'm not sure if this was answered. But my question was in regards to the financials in terms of what's the estimated cost. I know it's minimal, but do we have a number at all of what the water, electric, you know, insurance, I guess. So it would be there. And if so, I'm assuming this is years away. This isn't for next year, right? This is, I just heard overhead. I just overheard Council Rest asking about time, so we're a couple of years out, correct? Council McBride, I'm having a very difficult time hearing you. Can you repeat yourself? Because I couldn't understand what I, you were saying. I think I understand. Yes, sorry. Uh, apologize. I, I think my, my, I have two questions. One, the, the cost, is there an estimated cost of what this will be? I mean, I'm in total favor of the project, just, just, just to start. But the cost of the, you know, the electricity, heat, the gas, um, the insurance and so forth, do we have a number for that? And I was concerned because I didn't know the timing of this, but it sounds like the timing is we're, we're several years away in any event, correct? As far as the timing, I don't think it's several years away. I believe that their intention was to start um, the project this year. Uh, I think they're a little bit behind what they had originally anticipated. I think they were looking at the spring, which we put them you know, right this time of the year, and I don't believe that they've, they've done any groundbreaking. And uh, again, I don't expect there to be much. I think it's almost negligible. I think that's what we found in the contract that any utilities or anything like that was prorated. So it's at a very low cost to the town, if, if at all. And I wouldn't expect an increase to the insurance if it would need to be very tiny. But usually this type of thing is, is pretty much just put under the coverage. Yeah. And the electricity and utility, that would all be covered in next year's current budget, correct? Is that, it's not substantial? I, I, again, I don't believe it would be substantial. I believe it would be negligible. And yes, it okay, would be thank you. Under the... thank you for that. I, I am in favor. This is a great, great add to the, to the department. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, uh, Chief Fasaro. And um, excellent. I'm in support of this. Um, my basic question is, are there any special requirements you're going to need from a policing point of view for this property? I don't believe so. I mean, anything that we'd outfit in there would be stuff that we would take from existing stock or maybe some surplus stuff from around the town facilities, desks. And I believe some of that may actually be provided. So I don't, I don't expect any other additional costs. Do we need any extra security because it's a, a police location that? I don't believe so. Uh, you know, there were no sensitive items or um, access to any police data systems will be uh, available to anybody. So I, I think it's. You know, again, it's, an, it's going to be an unoccupied building, so if there's any suspicious activity, obviously our officers will respond right away. And do you have any plans for keeping records or no. that kind of thing? It's just no. a, basically a place for them to sort of take a break, fill out reports. Um, That's right. Maybe meet with someone, have discussions, you know, like yeah. I said, office hours. And rather than coming all the way into the police station because they need to take a lunch break or, you know, utilize the facilities, they can do it right there rather than driving that's their patrol area rather than coming back to the police station they can remain in their patrol area and accessible and available for calls for service how often do you does the police department use the mystic facility it varies from time to time i mean officers can go you know they have access to that facility when they're on patrol but if they're responding to calls for service 
Um, they're not going to stay there. They're going to go out to them, and it'll be the same way here. Um, we do try and designate some times when the community policing officer is available to go down there. Certainly during the summer months in the Mystic location, we have a, more of a, an active presence down there. Um, so it's it's really based on availability, the officer's individual availability. Okay. All right. Thank you. I am in full favor of it, and I think it's wonderful to have um, other locations where police can set up shop and maybe meet with people. And that I would assume that if somebody on that side of town needed to maybe give a statement of such, you can meet there. It'd be a, um, a space where you wouldn't have to go into somebody's home. Um, I think that's wonderful. Um, I do have a question on page 18. It's item number 31. Can you just explain what that means? Sure. Attorney if, if, um, so this has to do with something called an estoppel certificate. So if the owner of the property wants to obtain financing, the bank oftentimes asks for a, um, a certificate that the tenant will sign saying, um, you know, there's no default under the lease. The, the lease, this document is the actual lease. Um, you haven't prepaid rent for some significant amount of time. And um, it's, it's basically a representation. The town will sign that, hey, this is the deal. You know, there's, there's nothing you don't know about. So when you loan money on this property, um, as, at least as, as it applies to the town's lease, you know, this is, this is everything you need to know. Thank you. Yeah. And I know that um, historically, sometimes we get developers and then people in our community check out some of our developers and then they get upset because we didn't do a background check on them. Would we be doing anything like that if we're going to sort of partner with somebody? Would we be checking out the owners of the property? And I know it might sound inappropriate, but I just know how sometimes our community can be about these type of situations. We, we could certainly do so. It wouldn't be the norm on this type of lease. It would not be the norm, mm -hmm. but I worry that if there is anything that ever came up in the future and we were partnering with somebody and we didn't do our due diligence and vet somebody properly, um, how that could come back out on the town and how it would look. So I don't know how the rest of the council feels about that, or am I just speaking for myself? So it is up to the council if they would like to comment and say whether they would like that or not. But thank you, I think it's wonderful, and thank you for bringing this forward and working with people in our community um, to make this happen. So thank you very much. Councilor Bordelon. Um, I think, you know, any good, you know, you're not going to leave your kids with someone you don't know, right? You're going to do a background check. We are talking about a police substation in a building. I think, you know, I think it would be, you should know who your, your stakeholder is. Who, I mean, it's only a monetary amount of money, but I, you know, we should know who you're partnering with. I absolutely would think that that would uh, be part of the process, uh, you know, just in good faith uh, to make sure that's what we want to partner with before just... You know, you're getting a great deal, but what, what's behind the deal? And, and I think that should just be uniform with whatever you do, um, honestly. And any type of partnership or type of agreement you would want to have, that's just my opinion. Um, my other question is, is, I know it was very welcomed back in the day when I lived in military housing. Um, there was a substation there. Is that substation still running? No. It is not. You know, we had it open probably five or six years ago at last time, and it's, it hasn't been open since. Yeah. Is there a reason that it closed? I just um... Yeah, it, it, sometimes they have a need for facilities and move things around, so it's not, yeah. um, you know, yeah. we had one there for a while, and, yeah. and things have changed. Yeah, no. I know it was very no welcome. version on our part. Yeah, no, it was very welcomed at the time. It was a great asset. They did a lot with, like, uh, car seats and things like that there. It was really very um, convenient, and it was right in the heart of the military community and folks loved it so um, that's all. fortunately this will be close by so it's not and will you be able to do maybe you know car seats and things out of that location yeah, we haven't been doing those actually the Groton ambulance uh, okay. has been doing them lately but we'll certainly be able to do some yeah. community policing activities but you could partner and you know you could host an event and say hey we're going to be here on this side of town and maybe but you, you have to be certified car seat technicians so we would yeah. we would defer to them on that Right. But I meant when you're having your community policing events, you could invite, say you're doing some outreach and you're having multiple people there, you could invite the ambulance and they could be doing, you know, the, the certified folks could be doing car seats. It's another location to kind of, you know, get into the community a little bit. Sure. So we get some partnerships. Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
Would anybody else like to speak on if they would prefer a, the background review? I'm not objecting to a background. You're okay? Sorry. That's fine. It, just to be clear, that isn't something that we would necessarily do because there are requirements for criminal justice databases to be accessed to do background investigations on people. That we can't just arbitrarily do it because we're entering into an agreement with them. There needs to be a, a legitimate criminal justice interest in doing that. But we can look, you know, do general, uh, of course, internet searches, look at their licensing, their past projects to make sure that, that those are satisfactory. That would be wonderful. Council. Um, I, just finish that? I, I wasn't suggesting a police oh, I understand that. I, but just, <laughs> I was saying Google them. <laughs> just for the sake, of, you know, maybe for the public's knowledge, we don't have the ability, contrary to what you may see on TV, for a police officer to sit down at a computer and say, I want to find out all about that person. That's illegal. We don't do that. Um, we, again, we have to have a criminal, there has to be a nexus to a criminal investigation that we're doing it for. Thank you. Councilor Pacino, how do you uh, feel? I am all on board with John Burt's suggestion how to go about doing it. As town manager said, stated. Okay, you're good. I'm good. Councilor Parker, are you okay with that? Ready to vote. Are you are you okay with them doing um, a background review? Are we going to start requesting this from everyone that we do a lease with? Because we need to be consistent if we're going to do that. Well, so I just want to make may. sure that we start. we'll get ready to do something that we've never done before normally. So I just want to make sure we're going to be consistent down the road. Okay. So um, I'm neutral on that. Thank you. Councilor uh, McBride. I'm, I'm going to agree with Councillor Parker. I'm, I'm sort of in the middle. I'm deferring the town manager on what is needed to be done uh, with, with regards to this. Thank you. Okay. I think you have direction. Thank you. Okay. So let's um, vote on the motion on the floor, which was um, passed by Gajewski, seconded by Bordelon. Um, 2024-248, police substation lease for 99 Gold Star Highway. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Parker's aye. Thank you. Opposed? Abstentions? <clears throat> that passes eight to zero to zero. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Up next is the 2024-234 American Rescue Plan Act Human, Res Human Services Allocation. Um, Councilor McBride, would you like to read that? And the motion on that? Yes, I'm here. Just give me one second. Sure. <clears throat> motion to, to recommend a resolution approving 50000 to be allocated from the American Rescue Plan Act fund to the Human Services Department to be utilized for mortgage, rent payments, and utilities for those that have been financially impacted by the COVID pandemic. Second. <clears throat> Motion by McBride, seconded by Rusk. I do have uh, March fund for three questions, but I'll start off that we have uh, had pre previously awarded a total of $300,000 to human services to use for COVID relief. I believe the last 150,000 was uh, right around April, May last year. They're now at uh, $25,000 remaining. So I was looking for uh, for 50,000 to shore that up, and we'll continue to monitor it. And uh, we have, I think, I have 160,000 written here. Now it's over 100. It's in the higher 160s now as interest continues to, and we get some money back from projects. So there's sufficient funds for this. Okay, great. Councilor Bordelon? Um, you know, this is something near and dear to my heart as always. Um, how much um, actual funds did we get total? Uh, total about 8.1 or so approximately. Okay. And we've said so far uh, spent 300 towards this? Yes. Right. So as it states, you know, there was many things that this money could be used for. And I'm a firm advocate for making sure that the community is protected. The funds were given to us because lives were lost due to COVID deaths 
people are still experiencing long COVID and a lot of other serious things, um, widowed folks that are now in financial straits, jobs. Um, I, I think the remaining amount of money that we currently have should go into this fund, quite frankly. Um, when, you, when you stated the number that was already, you know, we had to use, and a lot of that went into some great areas. But again, every time we get down to the nit and gritty where it impacts the most is in the people's pockets. And um, this is helping our most vulnerable of our community. And we're only a community by which we have that diversity of income throughout our town. So I just, in good faith, feel like we should give more. So I'd like to make another motion. I like to make a motion to allocate $100,000 of that 160 that's left, leave the 60 in there as other money trickles in and we can reassess. If we truly are doing what the statement states and it says financially affected by COVID, our community is suffering and our taxes are going up, Board of Ed budget's going up, righteously so, um, the mill across the board. So that's my, I need a second, I guess. Yes, you do, point of order, thank you. McBride will second for discussion. Thank you. Um, so that's the least we can do, and that would make a total funds of 400000 of that large lump sum money that we received that actually is going to go into the pockets and feed the hungry and close the unfortunate folks that are struggling right now. So I ask for a counselor's support. Um, we've, we've put a lot of money into some big projects, but this is going to really help our community. We spoke at the last meeting that we wanted to put in more modular homes. Well, folks need money to do that. They can't afford their utility bills. Mm -hmm. I know my, I'm very fortunate, I speak from privilege, but my electric bill has gone up immensely. And I definitely had to reallocate my budget. So I can only imagine the folks on a fixed income. So I just think that the council, I'm hoping that they'll support that tonight. <clears throat> Thank you. Councilor Pacino. Um, John, uh, how did uh, they request this? Uh, I've been asking uh, Ms. Pondulis to uh, keep me updated on their numbers, so she's been sending me regular reports so I can keep seeing how the money's uh, decreasing. So uh, as I as as it started getting down, um, you know, I hate to use up all our money. I'm not. I don't have an issue with 100,000 as long as we keep 60,000 back. But really, it's just a guess. Like you know, we I, we have margin on the line. You know, if she thought, I, I'm assuming we would use all that, but I'd like to have Marge confirm that. Okay, well, my, my thought is if if we're gonna give them 50 now and we have, we'll have 110 left over, we'll still have another 50 to give later if, if they need it. But if we don't have that 110 in that account now and something else comes up that we can use it for, it's gone. We're not gonna take it back so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I fully understand Councilor Bordelon is saying they need it, and it's, but it'll be there. It's not going anywhere necessarily, but I, I hate to spend all the money in one checking account and, and then you know, to pay off a credit card and then need cash for something. One thing to add on to, being, we've discussed previously putting uh, some funding right into their budget um, for these type of purposes, but more broad, not just for ARPA uh, affected people. So I did put 30,000 in the budget to start a new fund upcoming. So they're assuming you and the ARPA have approved that there will be some money there also. And that one will be, you know, not just for, for COVID, it'll be for whatever's needed. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. well, in conclusion, I'm, I'm definitely okay with the, with the 50. Um, I don't think we need to do the 100 right yet but i don't don't disagree that they could use another 50 at another date they can always get it it's there thank you point of, point of information i just want to make sure i understand this correctly human services asked for fifty thousand dollars council borderline made an amendment to add another fifty thousand dollars that would leave sixty thousand dollars in our american rescue plan am i understand that correctly uh, there was no direct uh, uh, I came up with the 50,000. So okay. Yeah. Okay. So you came up with the 50,000. Just watching the numbers, yeah. Okay. And I was thinking along the lines of Councilor uh, Pacino. Okay. And Councilor Bordelon had another $50,000, so that's $100,000, and then there's 60000 available. Correct? Correct. Thank you. A little bit over the BS. Okay. Councilor McBride? 
Thank you. I was I was all in favor of the fifty thousand when this came out. However, I've recently heard, and I'd, I'd appreciate if if Marge can provide some additional information to council. But I've heard brief things about that EverSource. Um, what's going to happen with EverSource, and that they're going to be evicting people on April first who aren't paying the bills. And from what I've understood from from thirty thousand foot up, that it's going to affect a, a tremendous amount of people uh, who haven't paid their bills in several years not just a few months, it's, it's going on since we of COVID. So I, I'm in favor of the 100,000 for that reason, because I, I think we're gonna, you know, I don't know if anyone else has better information, but what I've heard is it's gonna be significant and and, and substantial come April 1st on the, how this is gonna impact our community. So that's why I'm in favor of the 100,000. Uh, but if Marge or Town Manager Bird have additional information to clarify, um, you know, I'd be willing to, to listen and change that. But my understanding is it's, it's gonna be drastic and we're gonna need that 100,000 sooner rather than later. And one thing to keep in mind, uh, and Paige, uh, point at me if I'm wrong, I, uh, we chose to restrict these to COVID-affected people. By the end of, by the time the funds were released, it was more uh, open to any general, general governmental purpose. I think some could be allocated, not just for COVID relief, but for general relief, yeah. So I just want to keep that in mind. If, if we're thinking about utilities like that, which it wouldn't necessarily be COVID, you might want to divide that up a little bit. Also, John, if I could add, um, the vast majority of the people that we assist with utilities are Groton Utilities customers versus Eversource. And Marge, can you give us your thoughts on needed funding and timeline? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, the, we don't have a lot of, of clients who are Eversource customers. And um, I have not heard anything directly about that particular situation. Um, but certainly it's that time of year when people that have been um, able to benefit from the moratorium are now um, coming, their, their bills are now coming due. And the moratorium has ended and suddenly they have um, a, a significant, in many cases, a significant bill to be paid. And oftentimes they have been paying on it, but um, it is true that rates are going up all over. Um, uh, and rents as well. Uh, it has been a, um, it, a real benefit to be able to help people to the extent that we have been able to with these ARPA monies. Uh, it has, it, it took a little bit of adjustment on our part because we're not used to being able to um, disperse the kind of money that we have through ARPA. Uh, we've been used to holding the line pretty tightly because we had limited funds to use. So I would imagine whether it's 50, whether it's 100,000, we will find uh, there are people that are in need. I, I, every day, this, one of the social workers will come into my office, at least one of them will come in with some cases that um, she needs to discuss that are, are eligible for this funding. Um, there, there are still many people that are recovering from the um, problems that occurred during COVID, and they're still trying to catch up on the bills that they incurred during COVID. So whatever amount we receive, I think will be certainly a blessing. And yeah, Mayor? Add on to that, Councilor McBride is correct. On I, I met with Eversource a couple of weeks ago and that moratorium is coming off. They have reached out to everybody who owes uh, money to offer different payment plans. They said there's about 10 to 15% of the people who haven't replied. They're not just saying they're not gonna be cut off at that point, they'll still be given a chance, but they have been working with customers, but that is coming and they are looking also at that 20% increase in their rates. So. But I would encourage if you go up to 100, maybe keeping the other part more flexible, you know, whether it's GU customers, rents, or ever source customers. Are you all set, Councilor McBride? Yes, thank you. Okay, Councilor Parker. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to do 
the 50,000 and hold in, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Burt, we can hold 50,000 to the side just in case. You can and still watch how it goes because <clears throat> I believe in talking to TVCCA tonight, they meant they did say, and they spoke with Eversource themselves that it was ending May 1st. So April 30th is going to be the end of moratorium. It'll start kicking in May 1st. So I know people are watching this and this might be where possibly the council says, Hey, we need to contact our legislators to make sure that our people are not going to be cut off on top of the 20% that they would possibly have to pay. Right now I'm at only the 50%. So until we can decide, I know we have until June 30th to expend the funds. If I'm correct on that, well, Mr. You, Burt, they have to be allocated by the end of 24 spent by the end of 26. Okay. So we're okay. If we hold on to the rest of the balance, and then play it by ear because something else may pop up that we may need to do something in emergency contingency. And I want to be on the safe side of having it there so that we can fall back on it. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Mr. Burt, you had said you were, you've been watching this account just to kind of yes. see where I want to make sure that there's enough money there to help people. To kind of help people. How mm -hmm. many other accounts are you sort of keeping an eye on that? Uh, they don't have much else. They, you know, they have that, the Flora Perkins Fund. That's about 10000 this year for, that I think, Marge, I think you mostly use those for rents. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Um, they don't have much else. So my question was more of how many other like here, you're watching um, human services. Are there other? This is the only one I'm concerned about. This is the only one that, that, you, yeah, that, yeah. You, that mm. you watch. Mm. Okay. Um, I think I'm along agreement with, with Councilor Parker on the original fifty thousand, and then just sort of allocate or hold off on the side the other fifty, um, just so we have enough of a balance there to um, be able to have some flexibility to do different things. So we can still allocate the money at some point. We have plenty of flexibility. We can always bring this up. Um, but I think having um, just a little more money in the back is a good place to be, and we can certainly move it when we need to. So, thank you. Councillor Brusk. Thank you. Um, uh, just in full transparency, I want to um, disclose that I do work with Groton Human Services with their food pantry. We're not talking about food, so it's not a conflict of interest, but I just wanted to um, disclose that. Um, I am leaning, well, okay, first question. You said um, it needs to be allocated by the end of 24, FYE calendar. 24 calendar. Thank you, that's what I needed to know. Um, so I feel like we still have time um, to allocate another 50,000. I'm not opposed to allocating 100,000, but I feel like let's start with 50. Let's, you know, kind of earmark another 50 as possibly needed um, and come back if it's needed. Um, if it needs to go someplace else, um, then, then we'll look at that. Um, but I am going to support the $50,000 for now um, with the understanding that $50,000 more may be needed in the future. Councilor Bordelon. Uh Again, what was that number that you said we got in funding? Total, I think, believe it was about $8.1 million. $8.1 million came through this council and we sit here and we're grappling over $50,000 dollars to go to our human services and say, well, let's just earmark it. Maybe they'll need it. What's currently in the account now, the leftover that we've used for in this account that you've been watching? In the, in the, correct. It uh, took about 25,000 last report. Okay. So we're, we've got $25,000 left in it. We're putting a mere 50,000 and folks won't budge for another 50,000. But yet we say we're up here to do the people's work and help the people in my opinion. This money needs to go to them. Why wait? What emergency is going to come in? It's a whopping $160,000 sitting in there. That's not going to do much. What are we, what are we, what are we stalling over? Do we, in, my, in my opinion, we, we should be putting that money to help our residents. And, and, and by the end, there's no telling that we that will be a council up here when it's finally allocated at the, at the end down the road. So why wouldn't you want to help the people now? Lock it in. 
show your commitment and, and, and make it go into that account now. $50,000, that's all. Out of that large number that we dispersed throughout our community, and we've only given 300,000 of that thus far. We do not have a soup kitchen. We have a community meals and we have other churches that step up. We don't have a shelter here. We also have, you know, the resiliency talking about we're in a heat crisis and people can barely afford to buy an air conditioner or keep it having run. Moving another $50,000, I do not think we're that tied up. How much is in our, our, our open fund account that's got, that's sitting there? What do we currently have in there today? Remaining ARPA, that's not- No, not ARPA, our, our, our rainy day fund, as you some you people call it. our general fund fund yeah. balance. And the uh, $32 million raise, right. about 21% fund balance. Okay, say that number again for me. About 32 million, somewhere so we have in that We have $32 million, 32. Dollars, and we're worried about a whopping $50,000. I've been on this council for a while. I've been on the RTM for a total of six to seven years elected. And every time we get to outside resources, when we do the big budget, watch, Perfect. it's barely $20,000 and it takes the longest to go through, but we rip through everything else with all these other percents. When we get down to outside resources, rate crisis, food and insecurity, we sit here and go back and forth saying, oh, well, it's an outside resource. It's not a groton, groton place. We don't have these resources here. If you become homeless today, we have no shelter. They go to New London. We have a chance right now to lock in an extra $50,000 for our most vulnerable people, and we're sitting on 32 in the account, and here we are, we can't even move it. I encourage this council to pull together and lock that money in and give these folks what they deserve. Thank you. Alrighty. And that's speaking from passion, uh, not anger. Director Fonderless, can you tell me, do you have other sources of funding also besides the ARPA funding? We have various accounts that we use. Um, as uh, the town manager mentioned, we have the Perkins Fund presently. Um, we also have our discretionary fund. Uh, we have a fund uh, specifically for the food locker. Um, and we have funds such as the Groton Utilities um, Energy Assistance Fund, um, where Groton Utilities matches any donation to that account, um, uh, 50 cents to the dollar. Um, and then we have things like um, Project Warm Up, um, Operation Fuel. Um, so there are various pots of money, and um, we're used to dipping into what pot is the best match with a, a particular client's needs, um, but nothing has reached the um, level of the funding that we can provide through um, the ARPA monies that we have. Thank you. And in the past, um, have you ever run out of money in this, in this, the council has not replenished it? No. So if you've ever needed money even throughout the year, You've come to, like, you could ask the council and it has been replenished? We could, fortunately, that has not occurred in the time that I've been in my position. Mr. Burt, if Human Services was running low on funding and they needed more, would it be possible for them to come to the council and ask for money? Yes. And does our council have money in contingency to cover these type of necessities if needed be? That should be, <laughs> depending on what all is going on, yes. Right. Um, but there's also the possibility that, never mind contingency, we could also take from the fund balance if that was needed or the general fund if, if there was opportunity for additional funds. Right. Correct? Yes. Thank you. So I have never been on this council where I have seen human services run out of funding. I understand that there is a great need in our community. I also will, I will support the 50,000 at this time and hold it in reserve on the ARPA funding. It does not need to be allocated until the end of the year. And if the money starts to deplete uh, quickly, you just come back in a couple of months and you say, hey, is there money still left in the ARPA? And we can allocate them. But um, I don't think there's a, a necessity to go in this route. All right, I don't see anybody um, else's hands up, so we will take a vote on the amended motion of $100,000.
Made by Borderline, seconded by Brent McBride. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Abstentions? Parker. All right. That fails three to four to one. We now have the main motion on the floor of $50,000 of ARPA funding. I'd like American to move another number. Your amended motion. Wait. I'd like to move 80,000. McBride will second. Again, we can do something here. We've talked about all the millions of dollars that we do. We don't have support services in our town. This money, we, I hear that it was stated that we can pull the money out of our general fund. Why do we want to make our mill rates and taxes go up and pull money out of that? I, well, take it out of money that we've already allocated into that for other things. When we have this money that's earmarked, basically set for a purpose like this that should be used for that. And that would be the purpose of locking it in. Again, I asked the council to look at that and it's a matter of locking it in for the community. Telling the community that, you know, hey, we're, we're setting this money aside, we mean business. I mean, do we, we don't, I mean, we have nothing here to provide for outside services other than the, the, the small, um, we have a human service that does the best, like she said, the numbers that she's been able to do with the ARPA funding these last few years. We don't have a shelter. We don't have any, like, people are becoming homeless. My grocery bill has gone up almost $200 extra a week with the inflation cost. So it's not just utilities. Why wouldn't we want to just mark it now? Why have them come back and ask for more? Let's do it today. Why, why, why waste Marge's time to have to keep coming back and ask? That just seems redundant in another agenda item that just makes us here all night. Again, I asked the council, let's go. Let's give them the $80,000. We got a nice, plush bank account sitting there and we got a ton of money in our and we only put 300,000 thus far to our most vulnerable needy people these are my son's friends that are are hungry and needing support in the community this is inf impacting children overwhelmingly thank you councilor mcbride thank you i'll support this motion again mainly it's due to timing uh, i have concerns about that 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 uh, April 1st time frame, these disconnection notices aren't going out. I believe Marge will be back in order. So why have her come back? Uh, it won't be until two months until she's back. To, and I think that those funds are going to be needed uh, because it's going to be it's going to be a concern of everyone. So that's the reason I'm supporting the extra number, mainly due to timing and to get this done now and not have to come do it in a, in a month or two when the funds will be needed. Thank you. Councillor Parker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So as I stated in my, commun my communications report, people still can apply to TVCCA for energy assistance. They just received a supplemental of $410, $410 for crisis prevention. So I'm saying go to TVCCA and look up the energy assistance if people are having problems with their energy assistance. So there are places that people can outreach besides Groton Utilities and Human Services. So there's other places to help supplement things where we can. We're doing the best we can at this time. Yes, we've allocated every single dollar and left some over for emergencies. I'm still gonna stick with the 50,000, thank you. Councilor Gajewski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I voted for the $100,000 because I just, I want our ARPA account to be gone, um, but I'm not gonna vote for the $80,000 because the previous vote um, indicated to me that the council did not wanna go down that road. Um, and, um, I have the, I can't, 
can't speak for the council, but my interpretation of that vote means is that we'll earmark the $50,000 for later and more to come back. Um, so I'm not gonna, I voted for the 100,000, but I'm not gonna vote for the $80,000 because it's, you know, almost frivolous in my opinion. But um, that's where I'm at, so thank you. All right, I don't see any more hands. We'll take a vote. Councilor Bordelon. Um, I don't consider 80,000, with all due respect to Councilor Gajewski, frivolous when we're talking Councilor about- Councilor Bordelon, please do not speak directly to other councilors as such. Okay, I'll speak out. I do not think $80,000 frivolous when we're talking about the life's welfare and well-being of councilors. So it may be $20,000 less, but our community is suffering. And I directly talk to these individuals in our community on a regular basis. And there's only so much that they can get. Mrs. Fondoulis has stated that she would find ways to utilize this money. Like, it's needed. So, again, if the council doesn't want it and you're just going to kind of, uh, I guess to the town manager earmarking it, what are we doing that puts a, there's no vote on that, so it's not binding, correct? Because you um, can't earmark something, it, like it, set it aside. <laughs> That's not even well, basically, it, you know, Fair, would you like me to I can respond. If, we, if, there, if there is 50,000 taken out of that account, the remaining will be sitting there and this council knows how much will be remaining. We will vote on how to spend the remaining and we'll, be, we'll have to do it by the end of the year. So we know it's in there and we, it will be voted upon. Right, but I, I, I just might, <laughs> so we'll just like pretend that we are holding 50,000, but we're not sending it now, but maybe we'll send it later and we'll decide later. Like I just, I think that's, I don't know. I consider that frivolous, in my opinion. Point of order. Your point of order? Uh, I'm, Councilor Bordelon is speaking for other people and speaking disparagingly, disparagingly about them, and that is out of order. I would agree. Can you please just keep your comments to the topic that you're trying to discuss and so, not um, speak about other counselors? Thank I'm you. not speaking about any counselor. I didn't say any counselor's name. I used the word frivolous, which was used, and it was not point of order. And so I think that not allocating this money is frivolous, which I have a right to say. That's me speaking. That's what I said. I didn't say anybody's name. So if the word frivolous is a problem, it should have been point of order before. So I, I think that not allocating money would be frivolous. Thank you. Councillor Parker, your hand is up. Would you like to speak? A motion to move the question, the previous question, please. Second. Motion to move. All right, move the questions on the floor. Made by and Parker. Madam Mayor is two thirds votes. Seconded by Gajewski. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye, Parker. So we have one, two, three. I don't know how we're voting. I don't understand the question. Now. Moving the question so we vote on the actual. Oh, yeah. Aye. Okay. <laughs> Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Councilor McBride, I'm not sure how you voted. I voted aye in favor of moving the motion. All right, that passes, 721 to zero. The question is moved. We are now voting on the $80,000 amended motion made by Councilor Bordelon and seconded by McBride. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Parker, no. Abstentions? That fails two to six to zero. We now have the main motion on the floor, which is $50,000. Aye. Oh. Yep. Oh, I thought you called it, sorry. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That passes eight to zero to zero. Can right. we take a five minute recess, please? Sure. Thank you. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. We are back from break at 9, oh, I'm sorry, 8.01. We had, just for the record, we had started our break at 7.47 and we were back at 8.01. Thank you. And um, up next is Economic Development Commission update number 2024-261. Good evening. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you very much. I'm Robert Boris, Chairman of the Economic Development Commission. Thank you, Mayor Franco and Councillors and um, Town Manager Burnt. I'm grateful. I won't take up too much of your time. I gave you um, a grateful to provide the annual report for the EDC, and we're also very grateful for your referral of the two questions to us. You know, as volunteers, it's uh, really helpful. We all want to be of service and make sure that we're looking at issues that are pertinent to where you want to take the town. So very, very helpful to have those, and we're focusing on them currently. Um, so just real quick, part of, there's, there's two components of what we're trying to do. We try to connect um, business resources in town with, uh, with different um, avenues for funding, and in that way we, uh, we had um, sector come and speak last year. Paul Whitescarver was brilliant about talking about the sources of funding for businesses there. Walker Potts came and talked about the Naval Consortium, and Bruce Flax is doing an amazing job uh, at the chamber, and he came and spoke to us. And we're, we're doing a continuation of that. Actually, tomorrow here in this room, we have um, the um, uh, sector is going to talk to the New England uh, Board of Realtors is coming, and so we're trying to connect uh, them with uh, with all the great things that sector is doing. So in a nutshell, what we're really focused on is outreach. After COVID sort of disconnected us from the local business community, um, we realized that in order to really give you guys good advice about how to help support the business community, the best thing we could do is actually talk to businesses. So we've, you know, we're getting energized. We've got some great new members and uh, we're door knocking. Part of uh, answering your question, that you gave us, we're, we're speaking to business owners in those parts of town to, to kind of give you some really solid answers as to uh, how to promote development in, in the downtown and other areas like that. So um, I, um, that's pretty much it. I, I'm here to answer any questions related to the, um, the report. And uh, you know, uh, one of the other things at the EDC we're trying to do is uh, bring in some young energetic talent to door knock and meet people and um and i think you know if anybody has any referrals or knows anybody energetic out there that that wants to join us um uh, that would be wonderful and we appreciate that okay thank you councillor portaline um yeah i remember about several years back they were doing the door knocking and like kind of reaching out to businesses so we're still at that point it seems um because I know at the time it was discovered that we didn't have a database with all the businesses in it, you know, to have one mainframe where you could contact businesses. Has that been achieved at all? I'm sorry, could you say um, A database to identify all businesses, has that been achieved yet? So um, with the town staff supports us with the infrastructure that they have. So uh, last year, uh, we had a different member who was helping us with the outreach and we were utilizing um, a lot of the tools that um, that they were creating. So we have a lot of internal tools that the town staff is giving us. We don't have a separate EDC database. Uh, we just sort of draft off of the the support, you know, the in, the the good data that the town staff has created on that. And um, yeah. So. And. Um are you guys partnering with this? I know you do a lot in the city as well. Are you guys partnering with the city at all to come up with like a big picture plan? Or, I mean, because I think for me and from a lot of others, it's, you know, economic is everywhere. And one of the biggest drivers that I spoke about many years ago is the fact that, you know, I had a friend, son, fly in from California who got a job opportunity here. And he got off the exit and he stayed in Providence, flew into Providence. And he got off the exit in the city. And he was like, oh, great, you know, like, then he, you know, texted me and he was like, God, this place, like, looks like nothing. That, that's, and that's his opinion. Yeah. There wasn't enough economic drivers. So we constantly are using, like, EB as our, 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 like, gusto. Like, yeah, we got to track these EB employees. And 
I really think there has to be an EDC collaboration with the city. I know we have no control, but until we figure out ways to enhance, um, you know, there's like gaps, right? You, you come in and you come from the Stonington side and there's like, oh, wow, look. And then it's just like dead in the middle. And then it dies on the coast of the city side. There's just nothing there. Um, and I think if we really want to attract people to live here, work here, play here, and we're bringing them in from the EB side of town, Pfizer side, there's got to be some collaboration on what do we do with that side of town so when people get off that exit, they're like, wow, I want to stay here, right? Um, you know, I also talked to some of the folks and friends that live over on the, uh, that work, that live on the town side, that work at EB and Pfizer, and I said, when big corporations and big people come in, where do you go to eat? And they go, they would go to Mystic. So, because there's nowhere in the city to even eat with a cloth napkin, really. That's not, point of you know, order. so point of order. The, the question, point of order. Councillor Parker, your point of order. Please um, ask Councillor Borderland to only town business. The, this is the town EDC, not the city EDC. Two separate issues. We're only focusing on the town EDC right now in their report. Councillor Borderline, would you please keep your comments to the Economic Development Commission report being provided by uh, Chairman Boris, please? Right, and I, I think what I'm asking, we're allowed to ask questions, and my, my question is pertinent. There has to be some collaboration with the city. So that's, that's my thing. We need to drive it. We can't drive it on one small mile radius of town and expect when people get off the exit to EB that young folks are going to be like, wow, Groton's got coffee shops and walkable neighborhoods. So my question is, is there going to be a form of collaboration to kind of come up with a vision? Because we have pocket visions, but we don't have a town city vision. Is that anywhere in the plan? I can say, yeah, absolutely. We're very open to collaboration. We've had discussions with the city EDC. Um, you know, frankly, one of the things we struggle with is, and I think a lot of boards and commissions are like this, we, we need more volunteers. We need more diversity, we need more voices, we need more, we need more bodies to reach out and uh, get involved in subcommittees. So, you know, one of the issues last year we had, we didn't have the bandwidth to do a lot of the things we wanted to do. So, I, you know, from talking to the city, the, the issue isn't about willingness, the issue is really about engagement. I think the more we can inspire young people to get involved in the EDC, uh, to realize that uh, economic development is not contrary to open space, that quality of life is something that promotes economic development, especially with the transformation of the way we work. People work remotely. So a lot of the, a lot of the attractiveness of our area is dependent upon having beautiful spaces, open spaces, and a synergy between small businesses and large businesses. EB is important, but you know, there's a lot of small businesses here that we need to help promote. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that need to know that there's resources available here to start their own business. So we, we're open to collaboration. There's no, I haven't met any resistance from any entities in the city about that. It's just really manpower, mm. you know? And that's why I'm really grateful that, that you all gave us some direction on what to work on, because there's nothing more inspiring, like I said, than, than working on something that, you know, you've, you've chosen as a topic, rather than us. Sometimes we can sit around and debate and discuss things, mm. and they're, you know, they don't, they don't translate into action. So you gave us a, a good marching orders, and that's greatly appreciated. But, to, to answer your question directly, absolutely. Collaboration with anybody, anywhere. Yeah, and, and the reason it's pertinent that I brought up the city is because, you know, from the town side, when we look at housing and development, we're looking at economic development, we look at our city drivers of employment as our big ones. And so that's why I was thinking, if those people are getting off the exit and they're not seeing that, wow, you know, why do I want to stay here, play here, work here? Right. You know, you, you gotta, we gotta drive it. So anyway, I appreciate that and I do encourage, yeah, people gotta get involved and be a part and I thank you for your, you know, volunteerism and, um, you know, but I do think there's a lot of work to be done here in the town of Rotten. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Chairman Boris, for all that you do and uh, being involved around the community. I see you in lots and lots of places. So uh, thank you very, very much for you as well. Thank you for, for serving the town. Can you just remind us or re-remind us of the uh, marching orders that we sort of gave you, the, the questions? Yeah, to look into uh, downtown Groton and uh, more broadly um, to promote uh, the, I have them right here.
to promote economic development, um, airport expansion, uh, expansion of the seat system. I also have the honor of being the seat representative for Groton. I'm very grateful for that. And there's some discussions related to setting um, actual seat stops. Um, so we'll be discussing that later. I'll be briefing you in that capacity later on. But specifically, it was also to discuss economic development um, in downtown Groton. So right now, um, our uh, outreach chairman has organized us to actually contact the business owners in those areas to find out about what, what are the things that are limiting or how can we help promote or, or connect them with resources they don't necessarily know are available. The chambers sometimes have a little bit of a, you know, Bruce does a great job at Mystic and he's expanding to help broadly throughout the city and other areas, but sometimes business owners are so busy they don't realize that there's funds available, there's resources available, that's where sector comes in and other things. But uh, to answer your question, uh, the, the focus was downtown Groton and those business owners. So we'll, we'll get you some real good answers about what it is that's driving their decisions for investment and job growth. Have you seen anything sort of bubbling up initially in your initial surveys and talking to people that you're sort of seeing a pattern? That's, that's coming up that people are looking for, business owners? So, so generally speaking, so far, it's sort of a disconnect of information. So, uh, like I said, it primarily, uh, business, the business owners we've spoken to um, don't realize there's resources. You know, people, you know, usually you go into, typically you start a business and you, you realize what you're getting into and you sort of plug along and you make the best of it. and. Groton has a lot of resources for, for those business owners and they're not used to having to rely on that or, or whatever. But in terms of development, there's a complex number of, of issues related to you know, actual housing and all those other things. And I think that one other thing I want to mention, one of the things we're, we're focused on in that is um, the uh, POCDs coming up. So one of the, because we're so focused on outreach, communicating with the um, members of the community, to let them know that they're, they can give input into the POCD and how important that document is into decisions that are made about housing, where development goes, and sort of it sort of goes hand in hand with outreach. So um, that yeah, that's what we're trying to inform and you know. Uh, the other thing is that there's the community conversation workshops that the town is giving. There's another one uh, on Thursday night, which is brilliant. I know I saw a lot of you turned out for the first one. I thought it was fantastic. And I, I know a lot. I'm an egghead. I, I like data. I know a lot of it. But I thought the first presenter was very charismatic. And a lot of this stuff is really helpful because the more informed people are, the more trust they have in the decision-making process and the oversight uh, and the more willingness they are to uh, contemplate, you know, development in areas, they understand the reasons why. When you when you don't have the education behind it as to why you're doing something, there's a lot more resistance. So so it's it's very logical. Can you, um, just two final questions. One, can you just tell us where tomorrow night or Thursday night's presentation is and what time? That is at. Um, is it still the Nautilus, or is it different? Marine Magnet. Magnet School. Five forty-five at Five Magnet School. Yeah. Okay. Marine Magnet School. And then the second question is: You mentioned um, there are a lot of town resources that are available. This is a great place to sort of say what they are. Could you just say two or three of the resources that you would say these are ones that business owners should take advantage of and use? Well, I. I prefer not to misspeak on it. That's why I have sector come in and speak specifically related to what funds are available for what um, what different grants at, at different times. Okay. So I, I don't have that information at, you know handy. But like I said, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, there's donuts and coffee, <laughs> and sector will be here speaking to the board of realtors and and give specifics on that. Um, there's always some always changes. One of the things we also discussed. Uh, was um, talking to the, our, our great uh, community resilience manager, Megan, about how we can connect people with 
some funds that might be available for that, you know. So it's, I, I get, the major theme of this is we're focused on outreach and being a connector to sources of funds. So the more we can do that, the more we feel we're adding value. And then of course, your referrals and, and giving you back good data uh, related to, you know, what's, what's driving downtown and other, other investment. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bordelon. Yeah, so I know we had a, we hired a consultant, right? Was that a consultant we hired, John, that came to the Benny's Plaza? Forget his name. Yes. Yeah. Is he still work, does he work with you too a little bit to collaborate? That's my first question. I, as, as volunteers on the EDC, we don't direct or collaborate with the consultants. The information comes through the mm -hmm. town staff to us. Okay. So a lot of those things are, as, mm -hmm. in even the, the, um, community conversation workshop. That's all directed from town staff. It's a brilliant program. We're able to assist and support. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's a town staff. Yeah, because we're paying a consultant. Um, and you know, what I've heard from a lot of folks is there's a lot of just formerly developed buildings and owners. I'm speaking louder so I make sure I can hear yeah. you. So I'm not trying to be rude. I, I'm just making sure, sorry. Um, that they, um, they're just sitting there. And people are saying maybe they need to revitalize them to attract businesses to come in. Um, so, I mean, the Benny's Plaza has you know, been vacant. And even before Benny's left, there's multiple things that are in there. Um, the, the old, you know, movie theater in and around Big Y, there's gaps everywhere. So, you know, I think, like, what is, is, it, is our building structure, infrastructure too old and it's not attracting, you know, newer businesses? The owners, are they just happy with maybe... I mean, they must be getting losing a lot of revenue by not just having them there. Um, and I know the owners of Benny's had us in, you know, Mr. Regan, um, you know, and he's come before us for data centers and many other things. But, you know, there's a lot of properties just sitting here and nobody's doing anything with them. So I don't know what incentives they want. I, I guess that's that's my question. How do we uh, help them? Or yeah, it's a really good question. Need? That's a really good question. And for, for a lot of years, um, I think we've, discuss that at the EDC without talking to them. So really what we're focused on is the is real grassroots door knocking phone calls. So rather than speculate and you know we we have great ideas. We've got some great people on the EDC, but without speaking to them directly and 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 getting the answer like why are you not putting your money here or what is the obstacle, we can't really provide the greatest value to you to know if there's a legislative issue obstacle so in the process of communicating with them we connect them to the other resources to help them uh, be more successful but to your point it's we, we need to speak to business owners and the more resources the more other volunteers who can join us would be helpful but it takes some time and we, we need to get actual data from business owners to, to find out why because you know there, there seems to there seems to be more opportunity I see out there than is being taken advantage of. So right, right. Very good question. Yeah, and, and from the city side over, I mean, you know, there's you know the, the lot of the questions and a lot of the answers of why some of these buildings are sitting from the city side to the town side is we can't control the owners, which we can't. So these are privately owned businesses that have to want to do something with their property. So that to me should be our main focus of like. You know, are they planning to demolish it in a few years and build something up? And that's why they're not bringing any new business in. No one knows. That's that's the hidden like mystery. I, I think a lot of it is specific to the owner and the property. You know, some you know, not there's not one answer that covers everybody. So that that's why you know, the 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 helpful data comes from talking to the specific owner in the specific area and find out in this area how can we help uh, development. Um, right, and I think from the community side, folks have reached to me many times and said, you know, we got to get these places. And that's my answer is, as a counselor, I'm only one body, one person. I can't speak for anybody else. But I have no impact on helping or allow, making that owner of a, an abandoned building on, you know, any side of town to a formerly thriving building that's no longer being used to a uh, to a you know movie theater that's been sitting for I don't know how long. Yeah. A North End Deli moved out next to Big Y, which was a very thriving thing. I heard that they said they left because the rent got high. We as a town can't 
control the owner, you know? And so that's, so yeah. what is it that we're missing? What are we missing in Groton that other towns are, are able well, to capitalize on? And, and uh, until we figure that out, it's kind of a standstill, I think. I, well, there is, one, there is one fact that we do have control over. It's consistency. You know, the, a developer or anybody that's going to invest in a community wants to know that they're going to get a fair shake, that their, their presentation is going to be heard, that uh, the money that they spend in surveys and other things are, are, is in line with what the community wants, which is, again, why the POCD is so important. There's a lot of disconnect between some of our POCDs and some of our zoning regulations right now. It's just because we've evolved over the last 50 years. We live differently. And so there needs to be adjustments on that. And that adjustment needs to be in line with what the community feels. But until you have a consistency between the POCD, the zoning, and the way that applications are approached, developers that are not local are, are not predisposed to get involved in communities that are unsure about what they want to see because they're going to risk a lot of their um, upfront money uh, to look into an area so they just they look for another community there's nothing it's just a business decision so mm. that that's that's the general answer but i think you deserve a much more specific answer about specific areas and specific owners and that's what we want to get you yeah because uh the areas i speak of are, are, are owner not not corporate owned you know they're local owners more locally owned uh yeah. businesses you know that that aren't corporate and they're just sitting so it would be interesting to see, you know, if they don't plan on developing or they don't feel the right drivers here, it's interesting that they're not selling it either, right? They're not selling it so another developer could come in and, and, and do something with it. So it would be interesting to see. I look forward to seeing the reports, and uh, hopefully we can get Groton moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank because you I'm, I'm definitely for developing already developed land that's there. It's just Thank sitting you. there. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Gajewski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Boris, how are you? Great. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. I'm semi-stalling while I get the clock on. Um, I want to talk about the, in our council packet, where you've provided for us tonight uh, just a little bit. Um, in, on page 2 of 13 of your court council packet, um, it says the EDC was asked to investigate potential incentives for property owners to develop unused land. I know Councilor Jones had um, asked you about what those may be. Um, yeah. I just want to know if you were aware of any, you know, ideas um, that may have came uh, to fruition, but they weren't able to based on uh, if they wanted to buy the property and it wasn't for sale or mm -hmm. planning and zoning restricted it. If you were aware of any of those and what the council may do um, to help those from uh, happening and seeing development, especially on land that is redevelopable. Right. Thank you for the question. Um, it it, it kind of goes back to the theme of what we've been saying here. Generally, um, um, the, the issues of development are, are really specific to each property. And there's different property owners that have different business models. Some property owners land bank. They, they buy different areas and they hold them to wait for appreciation. They have different... Uh, tax structures as to why they're doing that. They have different investors. Like uh, sometimes it's held by a limited partnership and there's 20 people on that limited partnership. Some people want to sell, some people want to hold. So th there's all kinds of, of answers to that that are not helpful to you all in making decisions on how to incentivize it. What, what I'd like to to do and what we at the EDC like to do is, like I said, get get you specifics to specific areas. Like this particular the area, downtown, this group of owners, this group of property owners, this group of businesses have this issue that you can help with. That if you had this kind of uh, legislation or, or we the POCD was looking you know, to incentivize this kind of development in this area, then the community could have the input on it and the change will happen. But I don't have direct knowledge of any particular um, zoning regulation or whatever at this time that was interfering with a specific individual's um, desire to develop. But like I said, though, there is inconsistencies between our, our zoning and, and what we say we want. Like, we, we realize there's a housing crisis, but it's, it's difficult to figure out 
where to put housing and what kind of housing. And those are challenging questions for us as a community to answer. So um, again, we believe the EDC, we provide value with real data and then you can make good decisions based on that. And we greatly appreciate your data, data and all that EDC does. And I love how you mentioned housing because it really um, goes into my next question. Um, in your report, you provided um, a Brantford Manor update yep. um, and your work with Congressman Courtney's office. Could you elaborate, um, for those who don't have access to the report at home, of the work you've been doing there and any potential housing um, developments that you're aware of that could be coming in so the community knows that um, the EDC is proactively um, addressing the housing need, which is also one of our council goals. Right. Thank you. Um, so related to housing in general, that's kind of a town staff question. Um, they're doing a great job and they can answer better. Paige and John can, can uh, give you really, they get, did a great presentation at the RTM a little while ago uh, related to some successes in that. Um, related to Brantford Manor, what we, we looked at, um, you know, the town gave a tax incentive agreement for, for that. So we were looking into understanding how, what, um, why, and, you know, who, what it was used for to, to, uh, to have a better understanding of the economic um, Im impact of that. Like, you know, we all want more affordable housing. We all want to protect our most vulnerable. And that was a situation where it felt like we could do a root cause analysis of some of the issues that happened there and maybe provide some, uh, some recommendations for how to avoid oversight issues there. And Congressman Courtney's office was greatly helpful in getting some answers from HUD related to some of those logistics. So. Um, you know, I, I felt passionately about that as well. I, mean, I know we all did. We all saw um, the mold issues, and um, so. But, th but this was a this was a moment where we could do some um, just dispassionate looking at some of the oversight gaps and try to figure out if there's a better way to do it because it all goes into you know the the better we can fund. The town was generous and, and provided a tax incentive. The more of that money goes to to the things that we wanted to go to, the better housing we have here and the, the more investment in housing we can have. So that's that's where that came from. Uh, glad to work. Uh, my former off, uh, my former employer, Congressman Courtney, in his offices was uh, continuing the great work that they always do. Um, and my last question was um, something you just said earlier, um, saying consistency and fair shake. What would a fair shake look like to you, and what may have caused stuff to happen that where a developer may not have gotten a fair shake? Um, I think that a lot of times, you know, we, we all, people, we're all passionate. We have perspectives of what we think is good for our community, and sometimes uh, individuals who um, have one perspective uh, can uh, scream so loud that the facts aren't able to be put on the table for the community to look at. So I think it's, it's general conversation and it, it's human nature. And I think one of the things that EDC can, can add the most value in is making sure that we present facts. What does a development mean? What are the impact? What are the real impacts? Uh, not the sensational impacts or the sensational benefits, but so the community actually knows what's on the table. A lot of times, you know, like the data center and other issues, things can get very heated. And, um, and, and the, the, you know, as I said, bringing it down to our specific job here, it's to try to just present facts. And, and you, as the you know, leaders of the town, and then the towns, townspeople through their different um, POCD and other things can decide what, what you want to see in an area. But a fair shake means that we are uh, create an environment where the conversation can be had and all the impacts are shared and it's not sensationalized positive or negative and then decisions get made and move forward so um i hope that answers the question that's generally it does um yeah. and thank you mr Boris, for uh, taking time out of your evening tonight and the work you do with the edc and madam mayor you're back thank you Councilor rusk thank you madam mayor um Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for all that you do and volunteer, and thank you to everyone on the EDC. I know our boards and commission members 
don't get enough praise. Um, it is a lot of volunteer time, and um, and we appreciate what you do. Um, I, Councilor Gajewski hit most of my questions, so I won't have as many. Um, but can you um, address, you said business owners don't realize that there are resources. Where can business owners reach out to to find out what resources are available? The town staff is, you know, Paige and John are great, great resources for development issues. Um, one of the things all of us are doing on the EDC is handing out our card when we're knocking. It's, it's you know, traditional, like when you're running for office. We're really just, it's literally that. I'm trying to energize people with that too, like, you know, to, to do that. And um, handing out our business card and letting them, letting the, the business owners in town know that, you know, they can call us and we'll direct them. If it's a development issue, this area, or if it's a funding issue, we could go to sector or, um, if, if they're not a member of a chamber, we can go, you know, help with the Eastern Chamber or, or Bruce. So that, that's what we're, we're doing right now is really trying to hand those cards out. So it's like, you can call me, anybody speak to me or any other members of the commission. Um, also letting businesses know they can come to our meetings and, and discuss at our meetings and bring something up and, um, you know, gets on the agenda quickly and gets, uh, gets uh, attention, so. Perfect. And this may be a page question, um, but residents can give input to the POCD how? Is it online? Drive. Sorry. Not yet. Uh, soon we'll be posting the Greater Brockton page on the POCD, but initially people attend the community conversation meetings. That's okay. So since you're not on mic, I'm just going to repeat that. So people can attend the community conversation meetings. It's not yet online. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I, I have to say the community conversations are fantastic. Um, so thank you for those. Unfortunately, we won't be able to attend this next one because it's during our budget hearing. But um, it, the first one was fantastic. And there was great, um, great conversations by a lot of members of the community um, and wonderful to see so many people show up. So I hope they come again. Um, Marine Science Magnet School 515 on Thursday. Um, other than soliciting to find more volunteers, how can this council help the EDC? The way you it really, by giving us the list that you did from your goal setting thing, that's so helpful. Because like I said, you know, we, we can debate, we, you know, there's a lot of talkers that like economic development, so we can sit around for a long time and hypothesize about things. But knowing that we have a task and we can deliver is focusing. So more of that, you know, I'll give you some feedback and just, we're, we're grateful to be involved. We're grateful for the request for information on, on topics of, of development, but very much appreciate it. Wonderful, thank you so much. We appreciate thank everything. You. Okay. So I would like to thank you for coming this evening and giving us an update. Um, as I read through the annual report, um, you've been working on a lot of things in 2023. Um, you didn't cover everything that you've actually worked on, but I do want to um, thank you for your comments about the fair shake and your approach to community and developers with facts. Um, and we may ask for assistance because there, there could be some sensational narratives that are spiraling and going into some false information that is spreading through the community regarding potential development in our community. And I can see it from my perspective sort of happening as at the moment. Right. Um, I also have um, to note that you have the 2026 Plan of Conservation and Development drafting process. And that also is something that I've seen um, economic development do workshops in the past. And that might be a good I idea for you as well. You have helped GOSA, um, well, well, you have asked for the council uh, when GOSA requests state funds to purchase and set aside more open space that our council, your recommendation to us was that our council have a public hearing on such instead of us just saying yes or no to it that you're asking for a public hearing. And um, I think that would be a wise decision as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's not that we, like I said in the, discussion. It's not that we oppose GOSA, but you're mm -hmm. using public funds and you're also determining land use and just like a development or a not development, you know, public input. We, we felt that it would be important at every 
uh, you know, the buy-in there is important. So. Right, and we will be having a future discussion on open space as well, so I think that that should be come into our conversation. The EDC was asked to investigate potential incentives for property owners to develop unused land. That was my referral. Yeah. And um, you did respond and say that the EDC tabled the discussion due to limited viable proposals and insufficient bandwidth to propose all priority items simultaneously, and that you will be focusing on community engagement. Um, the Property Reuse Committee had sought your input on their text on how they wrote, and you did have a response to them. Um, you also had worked on the Brantford Manor update, um, and you said EDC could provide corrective action recommendations based on information that you had reviewed for that. So I think that would be very important from your perspective on how to help us so that we can not get into this, maybe some of the same situations in the future. If that could help the town, I would be interested in that. You also go on to talk about your communications with the business um, community and the owners. And from attending numerous EDC meetings, I will tell you that from what I understand, that is an ongoing forever um, task that will never end. And that is the goal of the Economic Development Committee is to constantly be in touch with our business owners and to give them the more information and to try and get them updated and get their input and how they're feeling and get the vibe of that community. Um, so I thank you for that and I hope you can get more volunteers to help um, assist you with that. I will take my second, thanks. Um, and I would also like to notate that I hear things about how our community and our residents and how we want more in our community. And we do. We want our community to be the best community it possibly could be. And I also find that it, it, we as a council have a responsibility in that as well. And at times it is this council's job to invest in our community, to make sure that we give the best we can to the people that live in our community including parks and recreation, um, you know, incentives for businesses. There's many ways that we as a council can um, help with those aspects. And with the items that we sent to you, which were the development expansion, as well as economic development promotion of downtown Groton, I look forward to you giving us your feedback when you have the data compiled and so that, that it can help us and um, we can work as a unit maybe to f go forward on some of these um, initiatives that will help our community because we have heard from a lot of people what they want in our community and what they're looking for. And I would love to give it all to them. We have incentives in place. We have it on, I believe it's the Greater Groton website that shows a lot of the incentives that we have for developers. And you can give the incentives, but you have to understand like why are they not taking us up on these incentives. Right. Um, so I look forward to your data when you have it back, and I appreciate that you came here, gave us an update, and it looks like you have been busy, and I thank you so much for all that you do for our community. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank very, you all. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, up next is the 2024-257 Nature Everywhere Grant. And Councillor Jones, would you like to read the motion? Page 36. This is six. Well, 37, maybe. This is item 2024-257, the Nature Everywhere Grant. The motion is to recommend a resolution approving the acceptance of the Nature Everywhere Grant in the amount of $40,000, authorizing the town manager to execute all required documents for such program and refer the matter to the RTM per rule 6.5.3. So moved. Second, Bordelon. Moved by Jones, seconded by Bordelon. Hello, would you like to introduce yourselves? Yes, uh, good evening, John Reiner, Director of Planning and Development. So uh, you've heard us talk about the Go Grant and Nature Everywhere grant uh, up here today as part of our most of our team. So I'll let everybody introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Clint Kennedy. I'm uh, Living Groton and also the Director of Technology for the Board of Education. Good evening, everybody. Clayton Potter, Community Outreach Coordinator for Parks and Recreation. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Ben Moon. I work for Groton Public Schools, director of STEM and magnet programs for K-5 and also a Groton resident. Good evening. Megan Granado, Town of Groton Sustainability and Resilience Manager. And uh, not with us here tonight is Dan O'Connell, the president of GOSA, uh, who's also a partner with us on this grant. So uh, we know that you still got a number of council uh, agenda items ahead of you, so we'll try to get through this relatively quickly. But we wanted to give you a, a brief overview of this grant program that we received and talk a little bit about the initial funding, uh, the seed funding that we're going to be getting and uh, what we plan on doing with that. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Megan and Clayton. I think we'll be doing most of the talking. But feel free to chime in. So just a couple of quick slides to give you an overview. Um, we're talking about the, the Nature Everywhere program and our Go Groton team, Go Groton stands for Get Outdoors Groton. Um, so what is Nature Everywhere? This is a program that's spearheaded by a partnership of the National League of Cities and um, Children and Nature Network and Kaboom. And their goal is to increase access to nature for everywhere children live, work, and play. And they're trying to do this in 100 communities by 2025. And why are they doing this, right? Um, studies have found that spending time outside is so instrumental for children's emotional and physical well-being. And so they're really trying to work with different communities to make sure that nature equity planning is integrated into community functions. And um, so last year they posted a solicitation. It was a nationwide solicitation looking for communities to participate. And what the communities were signing up for was the ability to participate in a two-year planning process to build a nature equity plan. And the communities working through this receive support from the program's technical experts, peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, research and tools, $40,000 seed grants, which we're talking to you about this evening, um, as well as once the plans are complete, it opens up the availability to catalytic implementation funds, and then also communication and tracking support. And the nature equity plans that are to be developed are really, um, you know, centered on extensive stakeholder engagement, including youth. These plans are really for not, if we're not hearing from our children in our community and what they need and what the barriers um, for them participating in outdoor activities is. Um, other things that we'll be doing include geospatial, geospatial analysis of green space. Um, so I know a few weeks ago you were talking about parks in the northwestern corner of town. So conversations like that will be folded into this. Um, consideration of existing programs that help connect youth to nature and how potentially we could expand those. Um, looking at different policy recommendation, recommendations to remove barriers and then also perhaps on the ground implementation projects, new park spaces, new trails, new outdoor play spaces, all of those sorts of things. And the goal here is really transformational change. And so how the program talks about transformational change is wanting to make sure that access to nature isn't dictated by the color of a child's skin or how much money their parents make. Um, Nature-based experiences are going to be equitably designed, programmed, and resourced, and that nature opportunities also reflect the culture of the community and the diversity of that culture. So this is our team, plus Dan O'Connell from GOSA. Um, so, uh, you know, we have great representation from the town, the school system, and then, of course, our nonprofit partner with GOSA, being one of our major open space landholders in the town. And uh, timeline of things. So we applied for this over the summer, and I, I do want to take a moment to reflect, though, that. I think why we were successful in receiving this, and we were selected, we are one of 19 communities from across the nation selected this year to do this. And I think it's in large part because most of the people on this team were already working on this. Groton Public Schools and GOSA was in cheerleading from the town, has been working to get kids outside, um, and they're continuing to work on it. So this spring and summer, they have 12 hikes booked that will get over 650 of our elementary, middle, and high schoolers out. So this is all stuff that's happening um, sort of behind the scenes. We wanted to take a moment to just like put a little light on it. It's tremendous work that's happening uh, to try to get our Groton kids out in nature, sometimes going on their very first hike. Um, but in terms of this process of nature equity planning, um, sorry, John, if you could go back one slide. Uh, we started in November. We attended a vision lab. We got to meet some of the other teams. 
and uh, the, the program is guiding us through these steps, and so we're working on initial steps of figuring out who are our stakeholders, who are all the people that we have to be bringing into these conversations, what are our policies that intersect with how kids spend time outside. Um, we are also starting to work on that community engagement, putting together tabling materials. We'll be having a table focus on this at the Earth Day Expo and you know, just kind of taking off from there. Um, we're also talking about putting together a Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights as one of our uh, first initiatives. These can be kind of rallying cries that explain to people really succinctly what this is all about. So I put an example from a town in California's, and it just highlights you know, what every kid in their community should get to do outside. Things like splashing in the water, playing in a safe place. Um, so you know, that might be one of the ways that we try to kind of crystallize our messaging and communication with people about why this all is so important. Um, and we are here tonight talking more specifically about the seed funding portion of this and requesting um, approval to accept the seed funds and also let you know what we propose to do with them. And so I'm going to turn it over to Clayton for that. Okay, so the seed funding that we're eligible for up to $40,000 um, and we're also sort of ahead of the curve. Uh, not only were we one of the one of 19 cities selected nationwide, but as we work with our technical assistant, we are continuously told that what you're doing is really good, and we might want to bring this back to other groups. And then we had already started thinking about using some of this initial funding to hire people for doing this community engagement work and making sure that youth are involved and being represented. And then in some of the examples that came up in the following meeting with Nature Everywhere of how to use that funding, that was one of the examples. Um, so we're just right on track. Um, and then for these positions, we're looking to hire a youth organizer who would be at least at the graduate level, um, but might be a community member, uh, definitely an adult, a community member, a teacher, somebody who's passionate about this work and interested in sort of joining the team and helping uh, make these connections to our community members. And then we would want to add on two to three high school interns to also be involved in this project. Um, the youth organizer, the adult role, the older role, would um, work with us maybe somewhere 10 to 15 hours a week for a one year period. And the high school, high school students would work along the same time period, but at you know reduced hours. Um, we would, Parks and Recreation is looking to receive the funds, manage them, and be able to pay these people. Um, I would work closely with all of them. They'd also work with the rest of the team. Um, but as a community outreach coordinator, I'd be one of the point people. And that's um, for the purpose of doing the outreach, but we're looking at um, all different ways for them to engage with community members. So they would be working with adults, families, um, and parents, but also how can our high school students utilize their connections amongst the peers and their schools as young people, what are ways that they can connect with our elementary and our middle school students, and then let them utilize all the different creative means that they have of doing outreach that might you know, be a little different than how we normally do things with public meetings, um, but use it so you know that could look like TikTok, that could look like peer interviews, um, things that are really driven by them. But then we also want to use it as a youth development opportunity, so that they have, um, op so that they have the chance to maybe speak in a more formal setting like this, or lead, lead public input sessions where the youth are at the are in your positions, and people are coming to them and asking them questions or providing their input, um, and then ultimately that collaboration between the youth organizer and the youth leaders would you know, put, put together recommendations and proposals uh, in, in alignment with the team. And we would bring that into our next stage uh, to obtain that catalytic funding 
for implement, implementing different projects that Megan referenced. Councilor Bordelon. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is extremely important with definitely the increase in technology, even from, you know, my generation of graduating from Fitch, you know, 98, you know, then I'm going to college. I remember the computers being like a big deal of AOL and, you know, the dial up modem and it draw, you know, drew us in. And, you know, even with my own, my children growing up, you know, making sure I was giving them more balance of, of, of computer time versus access time even though my son now laughs at me because he's like, mom, I'm in the Navy and I'm on a computer all day long. So the one thing I kept him from is what he does. It's like, it's kind of funny. We just joke about it. But with that, um, you know, with my husband was, you know, active duty military. We were from here stationed here in the military community. Community, We thought we'd travel, but we went up to Maine just for one short time. It'll be about a year and a half we lived in Maine. When we were up there, it was a different culture, a different way of life. Nature was everywhere. And the, the philosophies were just much different. I also worked as a pair in the Groton Public Schools and been out in the recess. And, and if the temperature dropped between a certain level, kids couldn't go out. They had to stand on the blacktop on this little two by two and the kids were just running into each other, just kind of trying to find anything to do. And it was almost kind of sad. And my short time up in Maine living, like engulfed, living for a few seasons, if they did that kind of philosophy, the kids would never get out. And so they were like, Mrs. Bordelon, these kids need to come in full snow boots that are below zero with bibs and coats and things that were below zero type of gear because these kids didn't stay on the black top. They had little safe sleds with approved hills where kids could go sledding. Kids could touch the snow and not be you know, told not to. So when you talk about changing the culture, those are things I'm hoping that will change in Groton that, you know, we don't want kids throwing snowballs at each other, but why couldn't kids bring snow boots and snow pants and bibs and have an approved snow rec area? Let them get in the snow. That is nature. That is development. That is, cult that is, that is important. And in Maine, I learned that you know, hiking was all there was to do in certain areas. And so it was a way of life. Um, and we did so much hiking in Maine and so much, you know, it was amazing. But just embracing that way it's just because it's cold well then you maybe recess is 25 minutes so you let them go out for 10 minutes like let them get out one lap around the building like touch the snow i'm going to lose time and i'll speak again so i'm in full support of this i feel we have to find a way and we have to look at those <laughs> barriers because there are families that just aren't interested in hiking but it doesn't mean that those children should not have a chance to be exposed to it and so having this availability could enhance. It also is showing with cognitive ability, ADD, ADHD, kids have more time to be outside, it's so important. As a person who lived through the West Side Cutler Middle School debacle, as I call it, you know, the upper middle lower class, as, as people said, it was unfortunate because you could see the disparities as a person who went through it and felt it when I merged in high school. There was a hiking club at Cutler, but West Side didn't have one. On the lower, you know, like more minority popular side, didn't have the same activities. So those are things that we have to, and having one middle school now, we can merge. And I'll take my second turn when I get a chance, but I'm all about nature and support, and I'm, I'm a full advocate, and I'll, I'll continue after. Thank you. Councilor Rusk. Thank you. Um, thank you for bringing this forward. I'm absolutely in full support of this. Um, I want to commend Groton for being ahead of the curve. Um, I worked with Mr. Moon many years ago um, on the Sassicus Trail, and cutting that trail was very exciting around um, around Catherine Kalinowski and um, recently talked to Councillor Jones about um, the plan for the trails to expand, um, which was an idea I had many years ago, um, behind um, Thames River Magnet um, to connect the city um, from the north side to the okay. south side. Um, so I'm super excited about this grant program. Getting kids outside is um, always a huge um, plus in my book. Um, and I'm excited to see that our schools are continuing that process um, and excited to see this move forward. So thank you so much for applying for this and for being one of 19. I mean, it says a lot about Groton and where our values are that we are pushing forward with this and that we were chosen for this. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you. This is fantastic. Um, I'd like to highlight uh, Mr. Kennedy at the end there, who by chance just turned around one day and uh, came back and talked. I do a lot of work with GOSA and came back and we had an amazing conversation that has led to an amazing relationship between the school department. I'm one of the, lead, the walk leaders on Thursday, hopefully if the rain holds off, 
Um, for kindergartners, we're taking them through Avery Farm. Um, I've been on many of these walks now with, with a lot of our students. I think GOSA did 600 plus students last year. And uh, one of the real side benefits that has come out of this is the parents come along. And they want to see where their kids are going and want to learn new things. And most of these parents have never, don't even know we have trails. We have just an amazing um, access to the outdoors and the trails and stuff. So a thank you to Mr. Kennedy for going, turning around and coming back and going, hey, let's have a conversation. And uh, it just kind of went in a great direction. So, so I support this. It's great. I've seen the benefits directly. I've led many of these hikes and I can hope to continue. I think I have three of them scheduled coming up. And um, uh, I think you guys are doing a great job. And that now it's turned into this huge program um, is just a tribute to all the work that you guys are doing. And um, just keep going. So. Councilor Bordelon. Yeah, thank you. So again, I just think that it's so important that, you know, one of the, the, you know, I consider, you know, swimming a public health concern. There's folks that, you know, families may just not be swimmers and don't expose children to water. Some people might think that's foreign, but there are children in our schools that don't know how to swim. And that's another initiative that I've been trying to wrap my head around to figure out how we get that. Um, we don't have a school pool. But the point is, is that in different areas, in different parts of the country, in the states, different states, this is just part of their culture. It's not something they have to think about. You know, you know, nature is everywhere. Like that is their their motto. Um, but they are also struggling too with childhood obesity. Um, Maine had a high level uh, because there are times when it is just so darn cold up there that even they don't go out in their gear. Um, so. I think this also will address that. Um, I also worked on the Health Improvement Collaborative team. Um, and you know, we talk, I, I was a panelist for, I, I think I did a whole year of research with them on looking at the barriers to health and quali you know, inequalities and exercise and, and way of life are some of them. And I think this can help with childhood um, obesity and health concerns. We have high levels of cancer and heart disease in this area. And I think having this accessibility and teaching, you know, I do believe that, you know, parents are one subclass of like teaching, but anything else outside of that that they can learn um, is so vital. And um, folks may not even realize that this is a resource. With this, I looked at some other programs that were similar to named differently in different states that had other like nature programs. And a lot of that was also helping them to identify um, species of poisonous plants. So when they're out on a hike, like, hey, look guys, here's some poison ivy, or showing them the pictures ahead of time so that they would find it on their own, or what berries are safe to eat and not safe to eat. Also looking out for um, you know ticks, which is another concern I'm sure you're gonna hear from parents and how to address those things. And so there's so much out there and I think this is the right direction and it's so vitally important. And it's, I'm hoping that unlike before, that these programs will be distributed evenly throughout all of the Groton public schools, not on just one side of town. We have one middle school, but we do still have elementary schools dispersed. Um, the trail that uh, Councilor Russ spoke about is right by my house. And so I use that quite often. Um, actually, at least once a week, honestly, and even through the winter, I've actually tried snowshoeing out there and was very successful with a little bit of snow we had the one time. Um, so there's so much out there, and but the cost now, that's what people are going to want to ask. How do you plan to fund that one worker in this, in this grant? So um, right now we are working with human resources and our technical assistant from Nature Everywhere to be able to get really accurate numbers on what it would, you know, what would be a fair wage and competitive wage for the youth organizer. Um, and then we have some references from the schools who have an internship program right now at high school and those students are making about 16 or $17 an hour in their internships. So we're using those figures to inform what we will be paying these people, but with the 40,000, we're hoping to pay around 20,000 to the youth organizer and then have stipends that, again, would, you know, sort of be consistent with what other students are getting paid in their internships. Um, and <clears throat> if we are able to use about 20,000 for our youth organizer, 10,000 for two to three high school students, then we still have another $10,000 to dedicate towards putting together community engagement events, utilizing 
uh, translation services, having incentives for people to get to these events, or maybe there's uh, transportation costs, uh, different things, but that's generally how we're looking <clears throat> to uh, divvy up that seed funding right now. And it, how many more grants from this do you propose? So this was non-competitive funding that was made available to us just because we were one of the selected communities. This is, as far as we know, a one-time installment of the seed grant. Um, though, like I said, once we finish the plan, they have funding that we'll be able to apply for on a competitive basis to try to get our priority projects in the ground or moving forward. Well, I'm a big, big supporter of open space and <clears throat> conservation, and I think utilizing these things that we are protecting is so very vital. Um, I think we have a lot of great areas in the town of Groton that are underutilized, and so I'm interested to see where this goes. And um, you know, I think there's a lot of other areas that have, you know, are doing this and, and, and it showed great initiatives. So I think it's going to enhance the health and well-being of our students. So Councilor Gajewski, I commend you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just a couple quick one quick question. Um, out of 19, you said it was stated by Mr. Potter earlier that um, 19 cities were selected nationwide. Out of how many? Do you happen to know that or no? We don't. Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> um, and then um, as the Children First Scrotton um, liaison for the council, um, I do uh, appreciate um, your work in educating um, the use of hiking and trails in our community uh, with our students. And I mentioned Children's First Groton because if you ever have a project, I'm sure they would be happy to open a collaboration. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. And um, as, a, uh, as a young kid, I would have loved this program, uh, being a high school cross country runner um, and college cross country runner and now uh, coaching at the collegiate level. Um, having or learning an early age um learning the trails and learning our spaces um would have been really beneficial to me uh getting to high school and doing all my training i had to kind of teach myself the trails um uh, my mom probably would have been worried but you know i just love uh getting the kids outdoors and i thank you for your work and uh i'll be in favor of supporting and accepting the grant so thanks again and have a wonderful good evening i have a few questions um, so, uh, Director, uh, oh my gosh, Gren can I just, I'm going to say it wrong. Is it Granado? You got it. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so what is your role in this? Yeah, so I am one of the core team members. Um, so we've been working on this really in equal partnership. Um, we have frequent meetings, just us. We have meetings with our Children in Nature Network, National League of Cities um, kind of liaison. And then there's still the Go Groton team who's working on organizing all of the hikes and the community hikes and things. So there's, there's us, but then there's a whole host of other people who are working on this. Okay. I was just curious because of resiliency, sustainability. I was wondering what that uh, had to do yeah, with this. So, um, we talked about uh, with our application, we had to highlight different focus areas. And so sustainability resilience was one of the ones that we're seeking to integrate into this. Um, and for my opinion of all the things I can do on climate change, getting kids outside connected to nature is probably one of the more impactful things I can. So if there's ways that we can integrate that into this um, go grot, and if there's ways that we can be encouraging kids to um, develop more of a relationship with the outdoors and the natural world, since generally you fight for what you care about, then I think it aligns with overall the mission of what we're trying to do with sustainability in the town. Thank you. And then it says you were, um, the youth organizer position is intended for a graduate level student, whereas the youth leaders will be high school students. And you plan on paying these. And would they be brought on as temporary employees and let go after the grant expires? Yeah, so um, it would be a one-year position, and right, the youth organizer would be temporary, and we're working with HR to make sure that that um, position is still posted and presented with the same formalities as other town um, job op job offerings, um, and the youth from my conversation with our HR team, uh, the interns is a little bit more lax. We'll have to, you know, do different 
uh, measures to make sure that it's all that they're safe and that they're protected. Mm -hmm. um, but as stipended roles, it's less intense than hiring for a part-time position. So, you know, essentially we're working with HR. We recognize this is a limited pot of money. We do not want to create any uh, positions that go beyond this. So this is, uh, we have a goal in mind with this, and this is to get engagement, outreach with the youth, get them more engaged in the future with this limited time funding, and work that through into a plan and a guidance document that will then let us go after that larger um, kind of catalytic funding in the future. Gotcha. And um, I wasn't quite sure, like, when is this going to happen? Is it going to happen at recess at school, like playing outside, or is it during field trips during school, um, or is it during a summer program? I mean, like, exactly when are these? For the outreach? For the children going on this, out on hikes and so exploring nature and all that that so you described. I when does a, this happen? A few of us could probably jump in on this, but. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go on. So we have been engaging in these hikes for the last year or so with GOSA's help and so forth, which is separate from this particular grant. Um, it's really been a labor of love, people coming together and trying to make the, build these programs and make sure that they were available for students equitably across those schools. This was an opportunity to formalize more of this. Again, this is a planning grant, and we want to engage with people in our community to build these models and systems and then go off to additional funding in the future so that we can implement, maintain, and move forward. So the official Go Groton group, if you will, is, is a superset of what you're looking at here. Uh, the five of us plus, plus Dan from GOSA really represents this Nature Everywhere group that's engaging with, with the, this organization, sought this funding, was selected, and is moving forward, forward specifically around planning over the next two years. Those sites will continue. And, and also, <clears throat> so I, I, I'm sorry. And just I, one other thing. Um, so it's not just about hikes, though, either. So it's a lot more than that. So some of the other communities that are doing this type of work are building in nature-based playscapes uh, on their school properties. They're doing things differently on our recreation site. So it's not just getting out for hikes. It's getting kids involved in nature and not just um, uh, an asphalt pad with uh, metal plate, you know, materials, but getting them involved in that and seeing, you know, shade on the, the, the school properties. There's a whole lot to it that, um, and that's what's going to start coming out of that larger plan that we develop in the future with some of that catalytic funding. Okay, so I'm going to ask again, is this going to be during recess at school? Is it going to be on field trips? Or is it going to be like during summer programs for like parks and, or is it going to be a park and rec thing? I mean, I don't understand exactly the, when. The easy answer is yes, meaning it, all of the above. This is a planning grant, so we are going to be engaging in with the community to develop a plan on what this would include. I would guess that it would include many, if not all of those opportunities. Okay. Because I wasn't sure by reading the whole thing exactly, gotcha. it doesn't give a, a full picture of exactly again, what's is going a, on. This is for planning it. purposes and so forth. Then again, I think part of the reason why Ben and Megan play such a critical role of this, amongst others, is that expertise around sustainability, climate change, STEM education, and so forth, which are critical pieces to this. So yes, hiking is wonderful and important, but having those linked to educational standards and building a passion for this, I think, is critical to what we're doing and for the longevity of this. Right, I sort of just used hiking as just an example because sure. I mean you gave a whole list of uh, items and I didn't want to go through every single one of them. So, but thank you very much. I'll support this and um, I wish you all much luck with it. So thank you very much and for all that you're doing. I, just said, I don't see any more questions. One clarifying question, if you don't mind, um, there. What's that? Um, have you guys sought out uh, the Yukon Avery Point? I believe they have a hiking group. I just thought of youth anyway. This might be a resource. We're doing a, we've put together a whole stakeholder assessment. In fact, Sue Radway from Children First Groton helped us with that, and they're definitely one of the stakeholders that we've included. And Ben, you have a relationship with them, yeah. right, too? Yeah, and I've worked pretty closely with Sima Evan um, and the Eco Huskies over the years. Um, we've had a hiking outdoor exploration club at Catherine Kolnaski for almost a decade, um, and Sima's been another great partner um, in helping to get off the ground. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we'll take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 
Abstentions. That passes eight to zero to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a Thank good evening. Up next is the 2023-503 for Climate Action Plan grant name change. Um, Councilor Rusk, would you like to take that one? Absolutely. Um, item 2023-503, Climate Action Plan name, grant name change. Um, motion to recommend a resolution approving the adjustment needs to the prior resolution as noted. Second. So move. Second. Moved by Russ, seconded by Pacino. Would you like to give a little synopsis of what's going on? <clears throat> I'll try to give a, a real quick overview of what this is. So it was announced in June that we were one of the successful um, projects selected, selected for DEEP's first Climate Resilience Fund grant. Um, we are now working through the process of securing the grant paperwork with them, and they have requested a certified resolution. So we had come to you back in July of last year um, to talk through this. However, the state has certain requirements for what the certified resolution must include. They have specified that they would like this to be the name of the grant, and they have also specified that the signatory of the grant, being Town Manager Burt, must be spelled out in the resolution. So this does not in any way change the work to be done, nothing about the project scope. This is really just um, being receptive of what DEEP has said they need in terms of the paperwork to get things going. Thank you, and we passed this at um our cow and at town council and this is um, just simply a name change and a signature spelled out in the scope of the motion so I'm hoping that we could just simply pass this without too much discussion is there any comments councilor borderline um, was it just that we didn't have the, the proper information in there or did they do a whole name change so the curious. grant required a few different uploads I think four of the three, there was not a space to put in a title. The fourth one did, and it had the name that we had used, Grand Climate Action Plan. They would like it to be more reflective <coughs> of the intent of their funding. Remember, but this is a package deal. We're using their funding plus a CIP, um, which is why I went with the name I did. Um, but to be reflective more of the, how their funding is going to be used, they've specified they would like it to be the resilience plan. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. Okay, I don't see any more hands, so let's take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. That passes eight to zero to zero. Thank you so much. Thank you. Best wishes on that. Would you like to take a break? It is um, 9.15. I think we're going to take a small little break right Aye. now. There is no five minute break. We never go five minutes, so we will take a 10 minute break and we will re reconvene in at least, at the minimum, 10 minutes. Thank you. Recording stopped.
answer the time. 9.29. We're back from recess at 9.29. Next on our agenda is 2024-259 Fair Housing Action Plan 2024 to 2027. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Sure. Uh, John Reiner. Paige Bronk. You're not going to say what departments you're in? <laughs> <laughs> I was told I'd do that too often. So People at home may not know. So anyway, go ahead. Would you like to do your presentation? Sure. Uh, so very quickly, um, we are required to have a fair housing uh, plan in the town of Groton. Uh, this is a requirement uh, for a lot of the federal funding and state funding that we do around affordable housing, uh, especially for those communities that participate in the Community Development Block Grant Program. And we need to observe Fair Housing Act procedures and guidelines. And we have to re-adopt this plan every three years. This is the same exact plan, uh, although the staff member's name has changed in it since the last time that um, is the Fair Housing Action Officer. Other than that, the plan is exactly the same. This is something that the, we have to adopt it, wording exactly as this, as uh, designated and stated by the, the state. So I think there are some minor changes to the plan back in 2017. We had adopted it again in uh, 20 or 21, and now it's time to readopt. All right, thank you. Councilor Pacino, would you like to read the motion on page 49? Yes. Motion to recommend a resolution adopting the Fair Housing Plan for 2024 to 2027. Second. second. Jones. Moved by Pacino, seconded by Jones. Okay. Councilor Bordelon. Yeah, so this is just pretty much verbatim what the state gives us to, to adopt. Um, I was reading and it was unclear. Um, this is like the basic format, but it, I was trying to understand in my short amount of time from the time I got the agenda on Thursday till today and my busy life trying to go through it. Um, but what I saw online, can towns also add in additional things if they wanted to enhance the document? The state has told us this is what they want us okay, to adopt. So just because it was unclear, I was looking to see, and but other towns could add an additional document if they chose, if they wanted to enhance. So this would be one, but they could also say like we, over the next three years, plan to establish these these perimeters for fair housing and, and implement other things on top of this document. I, I think it's theoretically possible. Okay. Um, in all honesty, we would consider it to be risky because this is kind of a, this is a check item for them. And when they, the state through HUD goes to the state and says, this is the language we want. And you can see the reference to HUD, federal law, state law. Um, they expect us to basically get in line if we're interested in going after CDBG money. So I think in the future, if there's specific language, we might want to look at it and we'd have to run it up the state and find out if it conflicts. But um, most communities just go with this language because the state says it's the requirement. And then if there are other items or policies that we want to adopt, I mean, often those fall under some of the actions in our plan of conservation development, our affordable housing plan, and some of the other practices that we would do uh, through our everyday work and the larger plans and policies that we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was just doing reading some documents and they were saying that some towns have taken this and like in different, even different states have different write-ups, so obviously they're not the same state to state per se, but um, they take this in action plan, but in yes, in their other plans, they might say like, we want to enhance this particular section and grow in this area. And they might uh, identify um, outside the parameters of a state document, right? Cause it's just, a, it's a, like you said, it's a blanket. So it's not very unique to individual towns per se. And so some towns when looking at their drivers or their plans, have done enhancement documents to in other revisions elsewhere to kind of find where there might be missing pieces that may affect our town um, as far as those compliances and things like that. So, but thank you. I just was curious to see. Um, you know, I was just doing some reading and on it. Thank you. Well, I don't see anybody else's hands, so this might go pretty quickly tonight. <coughs> 
So we will take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. All right. That passes eight to zero to zero. Thank you. Up next is 2024-260, Small Cities Community Development Block Grant 2024 application. And Councilor Parker, would you like to read the motion on page 55? Make a motion to recommend a resolution scheduling a public hearing on May 7, 2024 for the Small Cities Community Development Block Grant CDBG application, I so move. Second. second. Moved by Parker, seconded by Franco. Would you like to make a presentation? Sure. So, uh, really, you know, the main item we uh, want to talk about is our upcoming community development block grant application. But uh, short term, we need to get the public hearing for that scheduled, hence why we're here before you. And then um, we can talk a little bit about some of the procedure. I think Paige is going to talk a little bit about the application that we'll be uh, bringing forward this year. Sure. Um, community development block grant in the state of Connecticut. Um, we are a part of what's called the uh, small cities. Um, competitive CDBG program. Uh, just to be clear, large cities sometimes are entitlement communities. Let's say Hartford, New London, Bridgeport, they receive their funding directly from the federal government. And I should say a much larger allocation from the federal government. Community like Groton, we have to compete um, through a state program that is managed by uh, Connecticut Department of Housing, who gets their money directly from the federal government. In doing so, um, they are responsible for managing their allocation from the federal government. They have their own guidelines, their rules, uh, and they will solicit applications from small communities such as Croton. It's a pretty compressed time frame. It always is. Uh, they literally just had their meeting this morning with the municipalities to advise as to how much funding is available, what their cap will be, the maximum amount that they will award, what their priorities will be, such as housing production, uh, and all of the other requirements that come with it. And um, the size of a CDBG application that has to be developed and submitted to the state, no joke, is about three and a half inches thick. It's quite an endeavor. Um, you see the schedule within the referral. We don't have much time to actually put it together. Um, we anticipate this every year. And we're always speaking with potential partners. And we did solicit concept um, ideas several months ago and the one entity that came forward that uh, appeared ready to actually move a project is um, Mystic River Homes. We are still trying to finalize the details on that at this point in time. Uh, we have done work at that property in the past. Um, I would say the scope at this point in time would entail a pretty sizable elevator replacement uh, replacement of siding and also replacement of old roofing at the existing structures. Uh, we're still refining that. We work with ECHO, um, Eastern Connecticut Housing Opportunity, I believe, organization. Um, they work with us in helping us actually draft that application, coordinate with the state, and also coordinate with the Subrecipient in this case, it would be Mr. River Homes. And, and this grant's different in many ways from others in that this is one where the state's not looking just for an idea or a concept. They're actually looking for the designs to be completed to a certain percent. So, you know, you can see from that really short time frame, if there's, we know that there's a lot of need for housing, affordable housing within Groton, and you know, some of it is this rehab type work. But if the applicants that we're looking to work with aren't ready 
with a, a ready to go application designed already done it, it's not going to be competitive and we won't get a grant so that's something you know as i know everybody's like oh what about this or what about that the partners that we work with have to have plans that are ready to go otherwise we're not going to get the funding under this type of a grant no that's a great point also we want to know do they have funding to help assist this project more than a concept you know, the, the days of doing a two-page grant application and getting significant money are, are pretty much gone. They really want to know details. Uh, most of these processes are highly competitive. And is there a partner willing to put money on the table, plans that are well-designed? Do you have a team that can execute this and actually fulfill what you're proposing? Um, so, yeah, it, it, there's definitely no guarantee. Groton has fared well in the past. Um, and we're looking to move forward and there's a process as you know with the council to have several meetings before we get to that um, that final stage where we could submit so we're requesting authority to um, basically work with the schedule and advance the project thank you councillor borderline um how many applicants did you guys have that we would submit to the state? How many people, was there a certain pool of people that applied that you guys had to pick from, or how many did you have? If we have one. You only had one person apply, Mystic? One organization that actually met our requirements. So how many did you have apply? I'm not, I'm not understanding the so question. So you could have, so for example, if you're putting out a job, right, you might have five applicants that apply, and you might choose one that is applicable that meets the requirements. How many people actually put applications in? We have one application that met our requirements. So there were other applicants, but they didn't meet the requirements, is what I'm asking? I would not necessarily say so, no. So only one we, person? We, we required that the applications actually complete certain state. You have to demonstrate you have finances. You have to demonstrate that you have a team that's willing to move forward with a planned effort, and the others do not. So other people did try, but they didn't have complete applications. Organizations, not people per se. Well, organizations, right? Folks submitted applications. We had in, we had organizations that demonstrated interest, but when they understood that they couldn't fulfill the requirements, they did not advance. So what are we doing in the future? I guess the reason I asked this is, again, I was looking online, researching, you know, how towns handle it, and every town does it a little bit differently with this grant, and there could be some more outreach. We talk about trying to help the community. Has there a, is there a plan moving forward? So like starting today, right? Because the next time that it comes up, people that may have applied that didn't meet the requirements, is there a way that you could help them? I mean, it might be a lengthy process or help them to understand what they may need earlier on. So that way next time this comes around, they're better prepared. Is there any workshops that you can start putting out now to kind of <coughs> make people aware? So this is a grant that's been around for a long time and the folks that, the organizations that apply for this know what's needed now for the next grant round mm. two years from now but they need to be able to have the capital they need to have the plans they need to there's a lot of things that they have to do that cost them time and money that we can't do for them well i was just thinking of like growing so there might be agencies that we're not tapping into that don't know about it so the people who have been applying know but maybe there's other people who don't and the one of the things I was reading online is making sure it's fair and accessible. So do we have a listing up here talking about all the steps online and when the deadlines are starting like now for the following year? We won't know the deadlines. But you could have something up saying a vague time to be determined. I think it's important to realize that um, the timeline is extremely compressed. As I said, we didn't know till this morning actually what funding would be available if anything right I'm just, um, oh, sorry. so uh, we in working with our partners with the state uh, and all of the organizations that we're aware of we're always open to having conversations with them and have them come to us we're always trying to push information out but these aren't these are not simple grant applications basically they have to have a project formulated to even be able to compete. Yeah, I guess what I was trying to say is like, you don't have to have a date, but it could be like, hey, CBT grants, here's the facts. 
no deadline to be determined. It's a small compressed time frame. That information can be presented and up online and accessible to the community. And then you can even say, um, once this one's through, say in April or May, you can start to say, just have an oral presentation where you guys can just present what those timelines look like, how compressed it is, how competitive, and what they're actually looking for. That Because there might be other stakeholders that are not tapping into it at all. So I'm just looking for a little bit more community outreach if possible and some way to track this. You don't have to have a deadline, right? Like some of the scholarships my son's you know, submitting when he looked the year before, they didn't have the date yet, but it said to be determined. But he kind of was already reading what they were gonna want and how it was gonna flow. So I just wanted to see, and when I searched on ours, I couldn't find that uh, anywhere. We have that on our website. It, it's standing, like just the, with a rolling, I might, I might have missed it then. So I'll ask, you could send it to me, that'd be great. Um, Cause I didn't see any announcement of like, hey, every, you know, year that we have this, it's a depressed time frame, the dates vary, um, reach out to us if you have any questions, you know, that type of thing. Is that on our website? We have a community development website that talks about community development block grants. Okay, because I didn't see that kind of rolling kind of, um, is there ever any presentations or any outreach in the community that you guys do? There's a presentation right now that's happening. We talk about this every year, every couple of years when we do this. Um, we work with partners and other organizations within the community. The complexity of the community development block grant isn't something that um, the average homeowner is applying for. And it, it has to be a larger housing organization. It's going to be our housing authority. It's going to be uh, larger providers of affordable housing for rehab. There's only so many of those organizations in the community, and we do our best to reach out to them. Also, the state makes people aware of this program. It's not something that's new. It's been out there for a long time, and anyone out in the housing world is aware of what the Community Development Block Grant is. So we do the best that we can with the resources that we have to engage on this, as well as the plethora of other things that we need to engage and outreach on many, many things. So how many? folks would have in our community. Your time has expired. It beeped after I started talking. May I have the two sec three seconds I had left? You can take your second turn. Uh, I yield to Gajewski that the thing was running. Is that true? You stopped speaking at like two yeah. seconds. Yeah, see. I asked just for that to be given back, please, in all fa fairness. Two seconds. Go ahead. No, I'll pass since you're, I feel you're being disrespectful. Thank you. And not fair. You are out of order. Please yeah. refrain from saying some comments like that. That's Councilor Pacino. Well, I have plenty of feelings as well. Mm -hmm. Councilor Pacino, thank you. They're obvious. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I read the background. I understand the issue. Um, the request tonight is simply to schedule a public hearing correct that's it yes any other discussion is oh can be taken up on the 14th of may right correct. so any of the discussion right now doesn't really matter right now <clears throat> we get to schedule a meeting and we need to do that first before anything else happens okay that's all i wanted to know let's just I think we should just motor through this and just schedule the day, which they already have. <clears throat> Councilor Bordelon. In all fairness, um, everything that's written on here, we can just ask, you know, how many people applied, and that is pertinent to just see. Um, but I agree, yes, we, but just asking those questions about it is actually fair and germane to the thing, uh, respectively. So. Um, this is the opportunity to talk about it, and um, that's, um, but yeah, thank you. Do you have any other questions, comments? Thank you. With that, we will take a vote. All in favor of scheduling a public hearing on May, May 7th, 2024 for the Small Aye. Cities Community oh. Block Grant. C D B G application. All in favor say aye. 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 Sorry about that. I thought it was at the end. Councillor McBride, I didn't hear yours. 
That was an aye. Thank you. Opposed? Abstentions. That passes eight to zero to zero. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. And Thank, Thank you, you very for much. Staying late in the evening with us. <clears throat> Stacked agendas. Point of order. Side comments. Disrespectful. I agree, Councillor Parker. Councillor Borderline, would you please watch your comments and have some decorum? Um, point of information. There is nobody to ask a point I'm of asking you to information. The mayor. Your point of information. Um, what I was trying to say is it seems as if everyone seems exasperated at the end, and I ask that we do not stack the agenda. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you. Thank you. It is not stacked. We have business to complete, and we have to get it done before our next town council meeting. Thank you. Up next, 2024-258, Retiree Pension Cola, July 1st, 2024. Councilor Gajewski, would you like to, oh wait a minute, no, I don't believe there's a motion on this one. We have to make decisions as we go. So would you like to introduce yourself and begin the presentation? Hi, good evening. Arnisha Green, Director of HR and Risk Management, and apologize for my voice, a little under the weather. Um, I come before you a uh, second time for me, but it's every other year that there is an opportunity for the unions to come together, have a meeting with management to talk about the possibility of a COLA increase for the different retiree groups. You'll note a little bit different this year. There's a couple of decisions or options, I should say, before the council. One is what percentage, if any, you would like to award. And 5% was included because that's what was asked unanimously from the union group, so we added that in there. And in addition to the possible percentage is also a note that was brought forward, so we are bringing it forward to you that a couple of the union groups and one of the non-union groups does not specific hello okay does not specifically have a five-year waiting period so that's noted in there um, i provided pension language in there i provided the actuarial review for three different percentages and with the five years for everyone and with the five years only for the groups that mention it. And there's a simplified chart that I added in there for everyone to take a look at each percentage, the annual dollar cost increase, and then the additional accrued liability. I believe that's it. <clears throat> Thank you. I am going to begin this discussion, I think, this evening. So I've read the packet. I also went to um, Social Security website as well. I've written down what we have given in the past um, three uh, COLA um, discussions. Um, the thing is, we, we do the COLA reviews every two years, correct? Yes, we do. And anyone who reaches their fifth year in the interim year, it's also awarded to them. But the actual percentage is only every two years up for discussion. OK. So in the past three um, reviews that we did, which cover six years, we have given an increase of 5.5% over a course of six years. Correct. Um, <clears throat> over that same time period, Social Security has given an increase during that same time period at 13.9%, which is usually based on um, the consumer price index, and which also covers the Department of Defense, the State of Connecticut, Federal Retirees, Social, SSI, and Social Security, um, those type of people look to the Consumer Price Index, which is the third quarter of one year compared to the third quarter of the next year. 
And that's how Social Security comes up with their cost of living adjustment. Over the past two years, Social Security has increased in 2023 by 8.7%. In 2024, they are increasing by 3.2%, which is a total of 11.9%. Which means that our retirees, over the past two years, basically, are coming out of extremely high inflation, very high cost of living, without an increase as of last year, as people on social, many people on Social Security get, because there are some of our groups do not collect Social Security. Is that correct? least one that I can think of. I think many of them do not. Right. So they are beholden on their retirement. Many of them are beholden on this retirement and the increase that they may get to offset any kind of increase. And as Social Security has said, the purpose of ECOLA is to ensure that the purchasing power of Social Security and supplemental security income benefits is not eroded by inflation. It is based on the percentage increase of the consumer price index for urban wage earners and clerical workers from the third quarter of the last year of COLA was determined to the third quarter of the current year. If there is no increase, there can be no COLA. And um, I have read the letters from the groups and I'm going to try and put a motion on the floor here this evening. I don't know how exactly I'm gonna do this because it's a, it's a little, I would like the three groups that have, there are three groups that are, it is not in their contract and they get their increase immediately. Is that correct? How it is written in their contract, correct? There is, and the two alternatives that's sort of broken up between the five years or splitting it as it's written for the groups. Okay. So I would like to have it in my in the motion that the um, I would like the um, which one is it now approved the five percent uh, number right? two is the one that has it split up between the two groups. So I would like to have the alternative. So I'm going to and I'm also going to request a 5% increase. So my motion is to approve up to a 5% COLA increase for active retiree beneficiaries that have been retired five years or more in the town non-union supervisor grades and telecommunicator groups as of July 1st, 2024 and approve up to a 5% COLA increase for active retiree beneficiaries with no waiting period for the police, USW steel workers and the police non-union groups, 2% annual cost those are just um, FYIs, the annual cost. Okay, so I'm going with the annual cost of the 5%, which would be $306,700. Second. Second. Sorry. So. Mayor, it would be just 5%, though, not up to 5 That. So I shouldn't notice. It's just a 5%, if that's So I'm just going to say up to 5% oh, okay. because the numbers could change depending on, right. So motion by Franco, seconded by Pacino. Any discussion? <coughs> Councilor Jones. Can, um, Madam Mayor, can you just explain, I just go through just a little bit, a little slower. Were there some, two groups getting one and three groups getting another? Is that, I just was a little confused. Or is it just what's on this second page? It's on 58, it's, on the, the, second it's the second alternative. It's the second alternative, okay. Um, uh, Director Green, can you just explain, um, and thank you for being here, uh, can you explain what the additional accrued liability means on that on page, <coughs> the last page that you have, this, the little chart? I don't know what, I see annual cost, but what is the additional accrued liability? So the annual cost would be the actual dollar cost, and then the additional accrued liability is the overall projected liability that will be added to the pension program when we get it, the actuarial evaluation done. Um, every year, there's figures in there that say what our, ass what our assets are, both market value and actuarial, and then what our unfunded liability is. So this is over, it mentions 20-year uh, amortization. That's how our valuation is done, and the discount rate is mentioned there. So that's over the long term, what each of these choices will add on in additional accrued liability. Um, explain again. 
<laughs> Sorry, there was a Sorry. distraction. Can you please explain that again? Sure. So the annual cost increase is just the straight dollar amount. Okay. So what is going to be added this on? This year and the next, in the next year. For, so each, for two years. Each of we those. Two year period. Well, every year for that 20-year 20 20 period. Oh. Okay. And so the additional accrued liability is in, it's not just adding on, you know, 103700 every year. It's projecting out from an actuarial evaluation what the additional liability is to what it is already from the actuarial report. Town Manager Bert, do you want to add anything else or do you think that just summarizes it? Okay. So is the three million four hundred twenty-two thousand twenty years of three hundred six mm -hmm. plus? So it's not just three hundred six times twenty. There's a actuarial review that an actuary does to indicate how that will affect our long-term liability, the amount that will be added on. Um, let's say right now the added last on to our pension. Added on to our current benefit. unfunded accrued liability. So right okay. now it's 38.9 million from the last report. So that's the amount that we don't have, let's say, assets to cover. So there's a value. That's the, sh that's we the have, shortfall. Yes, we have okay. assets and then we have an unfunded portion. So this would add on to the unfunded portion. So we turn it from 30.9 million to 33. Point um, the last report we were at 38.9. So this is just going off of the last report. What would be expected or projected out over that same 20 year time frame? So does the 3.4 million get added to the 30 point million as our unfunded liability yeah. that we are? And we're at, Mr. Burt, like About 78. 78.7. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. So if we were at a fully funded program, it would just be adding the additional 3.4 million, but we're at the 78 point. Theoretically, I would say that's right. I'm not an actuary, but okay. basic no, I'm just math, it sounds what the, right. What, yeah. the, what the number is, and, and that's something we do in the, in the at budget time, we eke into that and we contribute to this and try to bring the number down, right. the 30 down. So, okay. Um, can, can you just explain? <clears throat> okay, that makes sense to me. Um, can you just explain why some people have a five-year wait period and other people, other groups don't? That is the negotiated language, so I can't get into the reasons Part of why. Our time. Yeah. <laughs> just how it exists, right? Current it's day. Just, is it sort of just something that evolved over a period of time? Yeah. That's just the way they they kind of there was a better benefit for them at, who didn't take it and ones that did. I that kind couldn't of. say speculating of yeah. why things happened. Um, some things were the same over time, some things changed over time. So just looking at a snapshot of how it exists most recently, that's the language that's in the packet. Okay. All right. Um. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. I see no more hands. Oh, Councilor, Councilor McBride. McBride. Thank you. I, I just have to comment. I understand and appreciate the whole discussion on Social Security and so forth, but I have a different take on that. And just bear with me, I'm having troubles here. Um, Social Security is something that you receive at age 67, and you're truly retired at that point. Some of these retirees, um, they start at 20, they can retire at 20 years. So they're somewhat, sometimes 40, 45 year old people that are receiving retiree benefits and they're going out and getting another job. So I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with the 5% increase because they are, you know, they're still at an age where they're going out working. So I don't think it's accurate to compare Social Security COVID increase to a retirement age increase for individuals that are much younger and still earning potential dollars for, for one point. Uh, secondly, I think we're, we're heading in a different direction. If you look at the past, it's been 2% for many years. I think the reason for that is because that's a that's a livable two percent increase is what typically happens. This 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 you know this area, this state, and everything. People are now funding their their ADEX and their liabilities more so. They're not heading in the opposite direction and increasing them. So, I think at five percent, you know, you're it's not it's not one hundred three thousand dollars that we're looking at or two hundred sixty thousand. I think you have to look at what you're committing to, and by 
by doing a 5% increase, you're committing the town to two, almost $2.9 million more of indebtedness that you need to fund in the future. So I think, I think maybe we, you know, maybe this can be regrouped or thought through more, but I, I think it's not financially <coughs> prudent to make a motion for 5% because it's not 100,000 or 400,000, it's a year. We're, we're setting forth a increase in liability for the town of almost $3 million, which I think is, is, is way beyond what we should consider. So um, I, I'm not in favor of the 5% for, for numerous reasons. I wish I could speak further because I go into more detail, but I think the town's done a great job at 78%, but to go in opposite direction, increase their liabilities is not, is not prudent. Uh, so I would like to make a motion uh, to move forward with a 2% increase for all the retirees, which is consistent with what appears to be prior practice uh, with past councils. I'll second it for discussion. And we need to know whether that's alternative one or two, whether you're talking, uh, and, and Councilman McBride, um, the motion from the mayor was on the next page, The uh, it's 3.4 million increase overall um thank you so yeah so the option one is having every, all retirees wait the five-year period versus uh, going by the contracts so just to put it on the record i'm in favor of going with the contracts um as written and going with option two but your motion needs to specify which way you're going the option we'll call it option one and option two So it would be option one. So just let me hear me out then. So there's no option. The only options we have are to approve 5% COLAs. There's no options for less. Yes. No, if you, you look can at the percentage. He can change the percentage in yeah. the motion. No, yeah. But we need to know if you're asking for to go option one being everyone waits five years. Everyone has to achieve five years versus the going with what the contracts say. But yes, if you look in there, there's numbers given for examples for two, three, and five. I guess I'm somewhat confused. I'm just not comfortable with the 5% increase because of the increase over 3 million liability. We're, um, point of information? We're going to put on yeah, so. Councilor Jones, what's your point of information? On, I'm sorry? Uh, Cousin Brad just had a point of information on Option is option two goes with how the contracts are written. So okay. some of the contracts right. have a five year rate and some do not. But right. That's what option two is yes. to go with our existing and contracts and just give that right. right. And that's what I'm supportive of. And then option one is everybody waits for five years. Correct. Okay. So just for my clarification, there's no discussion on whether it's two or three or five percent. The discussion is the waiting period. Well, it's both. We need you, need you need to specify both which option and then under those two options, what percentage are you indicating or advocating for? But you have to do option one or option two as part of that. And then specify the percent afterwards or as part of that. Because there's a cost difference. If you look on page... Uh, 59 and the agenda packet those are all yes. for making everyone wait the have wait the five-year period so there if you look on that page you'll see costs for uh two percent cola three percent cola five percent cola if you go to the next page this is going by the contract not making it there's two groups that do not have to wait five years um so that's what page two is and then under that page you have two percent three percent and five percent so basically page <laughs> Page 59, 2, 3, or 5, or page 60, 2, 3, or 5? Okay, then I will amend my motion. I, I understand it better. Thank you for the clarification. And I don't think I'm going to get support for 2%, but I would like to amend my motion for page 60, because uh, I, I agree they shouldn't have to wait, but I would like to make the amendment to have they change to 3% COLA versus a 5% COLA. Does that make sense? Which option, 1 or 2, from two. page 58? Indicated page 60, which is the second option. Correct. Second At three percent. So he wants alternative number two with three percent. Right. I'll second that for discussion. Uh, before moving forward, I just have a point of clarification just for my notes over here. Um, what option did uh, count, uh, Franco uh, state on which page? 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear. 60. It's, she did the second option, page it's 60 not. chart for 5%. And that's where everybody... She did it for 5% and then he's lo lowered it to 3%. But the same... Same, same option. Yes. Same option, just different yes. percent. For okay. the contract. Just trying to make sure yep. I understand. Yep. Yeah, I second his motion for conversation. Oh. Madam Mayor. Councilor Parker. Can Council Borderon uh, cancel her, her first, his first amendment? Sure, please. I'll withdraw my motion, my, my second on his Thank original you. motion, and I'll support the second motion that he presented. Okay. Thank you. Any comments? Oh. Councilor Borderline. So I guess uh, to the town manager, and I'm trying to understand, like, what is the... Uh, what are what are what other towns do in this area? I mean, I think it's really important to understand. I'm really big in making sure people have a fair livable wage, just as I was advocating for you know folks to have accessibility um, to food and and, and uh, things. I I think people you know it's important that they can sustain themselves. But I want to just kind of understand the direction. What did we do two years ago? I believe it was two percent. Yes, and our two point five. And two years ago, we did it the same for everyone. The same for everyone at 2.5, right? The five waiting, yeah. Let me just double check. Just want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, it was 2.57122. So this would be a double. Uh... <coughs> yeah, I just think that we. I want to make sure people get a fair livable wage. Most average jobs, uh, you know, do about a three percent. Um, I probably could support somewhere about a three percent, uh, which would be an increase from the following years, but it also would help with the tax burden on the town. So, um, and I think it should be three percent across the board. Um, I think that's kind of a middle road for me. Um, I think 3% is higher than the few years before, um, but also would tap in to make sure um, folks are getting the raise that they deserve. I think when they serve our community, they should be compensated um, appropriately. Um, I, could, I wanna support the 5%. I'm just trying to really look at the numbers, numbers and navigate um, and making sure that you know, our town is also being fiscally responsible on the other end. Um, as well. I'm a big support of unions as well. But it's hard for me because, like, we could even move 50,000 for human services. And, you know, numbers. Council Bordelon, that's already been decided. You cannot bring that up in this discussion. Thank you. I, I have every right to bring whatever I want up. That's not. No, what. you don't. That's not how Robert's Rules works. Thank um, you. I have every right to state on the record that Council I feel. Council Bordelon, we will take a break if this continues. Please stick to the topic on the um, agenda. I'm a firm believer in people having affordable access to food, welfare, and morale in our community, and percent increases in COLAs allow for that. And so I think when we're looking at this, we should be looking at all ways that we're funding our community across the board, which is in my privy to say, um, when we're looking at our most vulnerable to our people who have served our community, and that's well within my scope to say. Um, so it's important that we we designate that um, appropriately. Um, I'm not sure on this one. I'm torn. I really, you know, I want to, you know, as I stated in the other items, is that the cost of living is going up. I know my grocery bill is up. My electric bill is up, right? So people are being impacted, and so um, needing these raises. Um, but also, we're, we're also tasked with making sure we can sustain that year over year. Um, so going from two and a half to five is you know doubling it so I'm, I'm not sure if that is you know the trajectory we should do right away versus a minor uh, a moderate increase i'll take my second turn later thank you thank you Councilor mcbride do you have your hand up y yes i do go ahead mayor uh, go ahead. is it my turn yep okay i, I guess my, my thought is really i'm concerned that we're, we may be rushing into this i mean this is a three million dollar decision and, and here we are getting ready for budget season and we're looking at you know a, a big increase that's just going to be for one year and this this is this is huge amounts of money that that 
I, I think we need to consider further and get more detail because I'm not sure if we're if, if we know how this is going to impact the future of the town. So I, I'd like to make a recommendation to postpone this to a future meeting. I mean, if we pass this tonight, we're voting on it next week. You know, but there hasn't been much discussion for, for a $3 million decision. So I, I would urge the council to maybe consider postponing this till we get some additional information and, and, and really understand. I know I need to better understand it. I'm just saying big numbers and <coughs> it's kind of frightening that we're proposing uh, to put on the burden of the taxpayer a $3 million hit. So I, I'd like to make a motion to postpone this to a future date. It has to be specific. Um, Mayor, do I, do you have any ideas? You have to make a, if you're postponing it, you have to give a date. Town Manager Burke, is there a date that? Well, I think part of what we need to know is what further information that you want. We can't really, you know, until we know that, we can't say how long it would likely take to obtain. Well, I think the information that would be relative would be what is a $3 million increase due to the tax rate for the town's residents in the future? That, that's what I'm concerned about. Well, I mean, it's every, every, yeah, I just mean, think that, it's a huge that, number. That's a, yeah, that's, I mean, that'd be a ballpark number. <laughs> um, in terms of, let's say that, is that 306, 700? Well, that's five. For 3%, the 184,000, that's basically, is it smoothed over those years? And that's essentially what the, now, a little bit of that won't be, some of that won't be general fund, but. Um, I, I don't think there's a direct correlation because this is the overall liability and every time we get an actuarial evaluation, they're recommending a portion of that for us to fund. So there may not be an even like for like. We can certainly pose the question, but I'm not sure that it equals X number of mills in year 15 or something to that effect. It's an overall add to the big picture and then a portion of that is usually what we're asked to do for a contribution we can certainly ask so that's just my general thought well it would be nice to see some actual figures on what the pensioners receive i know in other budgets they list out a pension roll that lists everybody out because i think if people are 60 years old and they're only receiving forty thousand dollars i think five percent may have more merit but if somebody's at 40 and their pension is actually, I think that's the kind of detail I would like to see because it would help understand if that, if that, not that it's not needed, but you know, there's a difference between people in pension at 42 years old working and, and making $45,000 pension versus someone that's only making 20. You know what I mean? I think there's more, more detail in, in all the pensioners and what they receive that I'd like to see before I would approve a 5% blanket increase that's going to increase over, you know, almost 3 million bucks. I don't, I don't think it hurts to wait. The that next increases just to, just to get more data. Town Manager Bird, that increases over 20 years, though. It's not a one lump sum correct, of three right. million and if, dollars. Let's just correct? use the 184,000 um, just as a number to use. You know, it's about in the new budget, it's about 4.6 um, million for a mill. It'd be a little higher in the new budget, but it's just so you get an idea. You know, it's a mill is one is 4.6 million. This is about 184,000. So, so it's it's not a significant increase. Now, do I? Do what percentage you, this of the mill? This is the three percent. At the four percent, it's three hundred six thousand. It's what percentage of the mill? I'm sorry. Uh, well, point six. Yeah. Point six of a mill. Six. No. 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 Can't be that. Point zero six. So you want me to do it on three percent or on the five percent? Doing the five. So it's increasing the budget maybe about one hundred eighty-four thousand dollars is what you're saying at three percent. Or the three hundred six thousand at five percent for one year, every year. Or point yeah, zero six. Point zero, point zero seven, six. Yeah. yeah. Point zero, yeah. zero seven. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> but it, I don't know if I'm still up or not. But it, it, it is a three hundred thousand dollar increase next year, and that's cumulative. And then in two years, you're going to increase it again. It's just, I, I, I guess I would just like to see what the pensioners are making too. I mean, I don't have that data, and I don't know if not that it's not deserved. Sounds like we can. That's not the type of thing we would bring. You know, could we find the average age to give you some broad thing? We're not going to bring in the detailed information. Yeah, I'm not of, sure yeah. by name, by and person. It, and it's, and whatever you do is have to the whole group. We could say we have this many at this age, et cetera, but that's about it. And you and can't. The, and the average cost to a homeowner for every 100000 value would be about 6 or $7. And you can't tell if somebody has another job. Is that right. correct? Yeah, we wouldn't have that, no. 
But we're not going to get into it. Yes, I just think it's a, it's a big numbers. number yeah. to make a decision quickly. Yeah. I didn't hear any of that. I didn't hear what you said, Councillor McBride. Can you repeat that? Yeah, no, I just think it's a very large number that I, I at least would like a little more time and information to digest it, but that's just my opinion. So thank you for the time. Yeah. Councillor Gajewski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just want to read some of our council packet for um, some extra information. So in the background that we received on the motion, it said all union groups requested an increase of 5%. As a courtesy, the town has submitted the union request to the council on the union's behalf. Let's read those real quick. Um, AS, AFSCME Council 4 Local 3539 President submitted the requested 5% COLA for 2024 is reasonable and should help retirees with the significant impact of inflation and rising cost of food, clothing, gas, home, eating, oil, and et cetera. Please remember the services by, provided, our, provided by our retirees as well as the fact that you will be a retiree at some point as well. The Groton Police Union, AFSME Local 3421, in their request, it, well, let me just find it, it said, I know we can't undo the past with so many years of not receiving a Coca-Cola, but if we could proceed forward with a 5% increase now to help the retirees live more comfortably, they worked hard for many years, especially putting their lives on the line on a daily basis. Um, our United Steel Workers Union said, given the current cost of living increases, inflationary costs, and adjustments made in Social Security, we would recommend 5% for both years to the COLA of the retirees. This would make up for the past years past when no COLAs were given and be more in line with current levels. Thank you. And then the Groton Tele Telecommunicators Union said, um, ba -ba -ba. After our retirees have completed their decades of service to the town of Groton as a result of the continued high rate of inflation and the adverse impacts the high inflation rates are or more be having on them, the union request a 5% COLA increase for all retirees in 2024. Director Green, I have a question to you. If we went to 3%, would we have to get the union's approval on that? No, each side submits, uh, like they submit theirs, we could submit a recommendation but it's entirely up to the council what they pick. No, so no, it doesn't have to be resubmitted. And what would the process be if we did go, like, could you, so if we did 3%, so the unions are 5%, where, what, what happens next? It's entirely up to you. It's subjective. Um, just because I can't do quick math, what's the difference between 5% and 3% on the budget? Isn't that on page, one eight, one, page 61? Yeah. 0.07. 0.07%. Yeah. Oh, thank you. The other one's about point three. $122,000. Okay. Yeah. Those are $122,000. Yeah. $122,000. And yeah, $122,700 if I can do the math right. So, I mean, the difference to me is um, not that much in the budget. Um, so, I would be in favor of the 5%, and the unions agree, and everybody can go sing kumbaya. So, I'll supporting the 5%. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Director Green, this. This 306, the 5%, is really just for this year and next year. So in two years, when you, when you come back. Oh, once you give it, it stays. It's, but we only look stays. at it every two years. So that'll be added on, just like if you gave an employer <coughs> raise, it just stays. Mm -hmm. And then if two years from now, you give another raise, that goes on top of it. So we could have. So this is a permanent, yeah, for the. This is for a sort the, of permanent. These, for these sort of just keeps on going. Yes. So in the past, couple of years we've had zero inflation we just happen to have a, a spike in inflation now but we've had zero inflation basically you know just a few years back so we but, but there was also yeah many years where the retirees didn't get we're doing. anything so um mr burt does this um a, a sustainable amount to go over for this you know i think it's okay to do one time um I wouldn't okay. do it every time for 5%, but I think with what we've seen, it's not unreasonable. Okay. So, I mean, I, I would recommend at least a 3%, but I wouldn't have a big issue. But with you're five. okay with the, with the 5%. And I'm just looking at, on one of the letters here, they kind of plotted out 
um, inflation is on page 65. Inflation's plotted out, and it's you know it's dropping quite a bit. So um, it has come down and sort of stabilized at a much more livable rate. So, um, but you're okay with the five percent. We can we can kind of do it. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm I'm fine with the five percent also. Councillor Parker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A couple of a few questions. I would like more information. I would like the breakdown of the every two years because since I've been on a council since, if I'm remembering correctly, 2017, we did give something in 2018. We gave something in 2020, but that is the year we gave one percent because of COVID. Then the following year, two years ago, we did two and a half. So what were the years beforehand? And I will be making a motion for a time uh, to postpone this information because I want more. Two, did we not just increase everybody's pay by 5% and does that affect what we do for their pension? And when is the actuary going to look at this stuff again? So I have some information going back to 2006. So between 2006 and 2016, it was not consistent among all groups. One year, one group got it. One year, another group got it. Between 08 and 16, it looks like nobody got it. It was in 2018 when it was cons became a little more consistent where all of the groups got it. And it was 2% in 2018, as you mentioned, 1% in 2020, and 2.5% 2 in 2022. And second, okay, yeah, I just like those numbers. I want to see the percentages we gave to each group at that time. So if we can have it, since you have it from 2006 till current, that would be nice, please. Okay. Uh, second comment, there was not a 5% increase for employees. And third comment, we asked the actuaries to look at this every other year once we speak to the unions and we get an idea of what they're thinking of what we are thinking. So just to clarify, we just did a increase. We just approved something for July 1st for everyone. We actually did something for February, if I'm remembering correctly. We so did. you're saying that not going to affect what we do because we just increased some people's pay based on where they should be <coughs> at because you just did a, a wage survey, correct? We did a classification and compensation study for the non-union groups. The vast, vast majority of those employees did not get an increase. The small amount that did get an increase brought them up to the minimum. So there wasn't a certain percentage that was applied to those groups. It was bringing them up to the new minimums. But that won't affect their pension is my question. Everything affects pension. Um, so of course it's going to, in the at the end of the day, assuming they retire and stay with us, of course. Um, and we brought them up to what is deemed to be a competitive wage. Um, I believe there was 11 folks and the majority of them were pension eligible. Okay. So the other question is, if that report also could show the age range, not people's names, which departments it's going to be affected or which unions is affected by or non-union so that we can look at it overall. That's my question. I'm, I agree where what Council McBride is saying that this is not clear. It's clear to a degree, but I think we need more background information. So I'm going to make a, make a motion to postpone until let me get my calendar out. Actually, that's when we're voting on something no. to our next cow meeting, which would be not there. Uh, I am actually going to say, would April 9th work for you to get us all that information? I will be out of the state that week. Okay, then I'm going to have to make it because I know we, the April 23rd is going to be. No, actually, April 23rd. Postpone it till April 23rd. McBride will second that Because the next few weeks we have budget. We have a motion to postpone, made by Parker, seconded by McBride. 
We need, oh my goodness, do, is this just a straight vote or is it two thirds? Let me just see real quick. Just can't remember off the top of my head. Majority, majority. Thank you. All right. Can we have three? Hmm? Can we have three motions on the floor? You can motion to postpone, it's not. Not part of it. No. Can you guys just announce that on the record so everybody can hear, please? He asked if we could have three motions on the floor, and I said a postpone is not a motion the same as um, an amended motion. Thank you. Um, so we have a motion on the floor to postpone until 423. And um, gosh, I can't remember. Um, it is debatable. Does anybody have any comments? Councilor McBride? Yes, I just want to reiterate that I think it's in our best interest to postpone this, just to get more information. There's a lot of other information, and I think to postpone wouldn't hurt any time. What's the, the timing for this wouldn't go in effect until July 1st anyway. So why, why wouldn't we postpone to get more information? There's no rush. We have plenty of time to move forward with this. So I support this, and I, I hope others do as well. It's a $3.4 million increase. Thank you. Councilor Rusk? Director Green, is there any reason why this can't be postponed until that date? Is there any negative impact to that? Not that I can think of. I just caution us on getting too close to the new fiscal year because there's some processes we have to do and it's uh, better to not do retro for folks if we can help it. it. Would this cause you to not have enough time to get it done in this fiscal year? If we postponed it to, I'm sorry, can you give me the date one more time? The 23rd of April. April 23rd, and then our next. Approved on May 7th. The vote would be May. Um, as long as I can get uh, from the town manager through the mayor exactly what is needed so that we can have everything okay. satisfactory. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you Councilor Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a, a question on the past raises that we have done. So mm -hmm. we did a 2% raise at one time, so that put is it sort of like a layer cake? We have whatever that amount of money was moves forward for basically for 20 years. Yes. So and then we did came back the next year and did 2.5 percent. That amount stay, stays. So we're kind of building layers of money that doesn't go away. So it, it, one doesn't replace the other. They just kind of stack up on each other. Correct. Similar to your prior question, each one of these has a, a cost that's built in, and that will stay. So all and the ones you that continue to add on top of it, yes. Like I don't know from your chart, two thousand. Yeah, there's. Yeah, so they all get. They just kind of like all a raise. move along. Huh? It's like getting a raise. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. They just stay. They kind of move. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Bordelon. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of money, and I think it's important money. I think it's important to support our people who have worked hard for us. But I can definitely satisfy the appetite of waiting so that because um, I definitely think there's definitely some more research here that needs to be done um, and that you know allows me to either get behind the five percent or maybe even propose a four percent is there any reason we couldn't do a four percent if you want an actuarial number there is always a cost for that to go back but it doesn't mean we can't ask for it yeah so I think just bringing enough percents ranging um, and really looking at that and you know i think if folks here are you know still having questions about is it stacked or isn't it stacked i think there's you know i think why make a knee-jerk reaction tonight if there's no rush and it's not going to be implemented until july so that gives us more time um i'm also going to do some research further on it as well um i did a lot of research on it and looked at a lot of different um is this something that unions are asking across the board of all towns five percent I don't know what other towns are doing. I don't know if other towns yeah. have this option written in for yeah. a COLA. Yeah, so I'm going to do a little bit more research on that. Is it is this every union asking the same across the board, or is it varying based on how towns have increased over the years? I'm not sure. But um, I think that gives me some time. I definitely think an increase needs to happen. Um, definitely somewhere at the 2.5 2 or above, but I'm not sure where. And I think the more time I can kind of reach out and get more information, I think we can make a better decision. Um, and I think that's important. Uh, but I do think it's important to 
uh, make sure folks are, are getting the livable wage. Um, not sure how the age delineation is going to work or not work. Um, that would be interesting to see. Um, but I do think that, uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, I think it's important to get more information. Councillor Parker. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, one more question about: Was this factored into the next budget, Mr. Burt? It wouldn't hit. I don't believe until the next. The ADEC would change the next year. Is that right, Arnisha? Oh, yeah, we're behind. Um, yeah, it, 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 it lags a year. So, no, it wouldn't so hit, this, it wouldn't hit this budget. The calculation <coughs> and the report lags a year, but the actual spend probably is in real time the annual amount, I would think. Because we're going to so, start paying at 7 1 24. Right. So, 25. So, that, that should be part of the budget? that we're discussing, get ready to discuss, or is it going to hit in 20, at the end of They'll adjust 25? the ADEC. They'll adjust the, you would start paying out if you say you're paying out 7-1, but it wouldn't actually change, we wouldn't change this year's budget. What we've done in the past is you get the new ADEC, the new, um, you know, the new recommended amount the following year. So we wouldn't change the budget so, for this year. I, so to be clear that we're not going to do anything, we'll start paying out July 1st, right. but we're not going to get the actual numbers that we should be at until 25. The suggested contribution, yeah. correct, won't come until the next report from the actuaries. Yeah. Which is potentially 2025. Calendar year 25. Early in the year. Yeah. Right around the turn of the year. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Pacino, did you? Thank you, you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have Miss Green. Hello. I, um, have we been keeping up with inflation with our COLA for our retirees? We might be a little under for what's been going on, and it depends okay. what indices you're looking at so I don't have them all in front of me okay I, I I get a cost of living increase in my retirement every year well wow. and it works um, to 25 years of service and you know but um, then I went and worked for the government and did the same <laughs> did the same thing so uh, I'm thinking that uh, I, I like the five percent uh, uh, I think they earn their pensions they did their thing, uh, and they shouldn't have to beg for five percent. They should just get it. This would help catch them up a little bit, uh, and maybe we can do two percent the next time. But um, and I also doesn't don't think it matters one way or the other how old this retiree is. I retired at 45 and got a job, and I still collected my pension, and I'm still collecting my pension. Uh, with that said. I don't mind waiting for all of my other questions till April. <clears throat> Councillor Gajewski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I'm just going to piggyback off of my dear colleague, Councillor Pacino said. Um, I'm fine with postponing um, just because we don't, it's not going to go into effect until July and um, it'll give my fellow counselors some uh, time for more information. Um, but if that vote doesn't pass tonight, um, I'll be supportive of 5% because as Councilor Pacino <coughs> said so eloquently, um, we have not really kept up with inflation based on the charts that um, we've been provided um, in our council packet tonight. Um, so that's where I am at. Thank you. I, um, I have looked at Social Security, and if you compare anybody to Social Security, um, we have lagged extremely far behind if you compare us to what Social Security increases are. Um, between 2017 and 2018, those two years combined, Social Security gave an increase of 2.3. We gave two. 
But historically, as it's been noted in these letters and from town staff, there were so many years that we didn't give any increases. There were some that had not gotten our increase, and I think it was from my memory. There was a group that didn't get an increase for like 15 to 17 years. So when you talk about people who gave their time and energy to our community, and then you sit there and not give them one increase for like 17 years, it's shameful. So I'm going to just quickly say, from 2017 to 18, Social Security was 2.3 for those two years. We gave two. Between 19 and 20, it was 4.4. We gave a 1% increase. Between 21 and 22, combine those two years, Social Security gave an increase of 7.2%. We gave 2.5. And then the last two years, with the horrible inflation that we have seen added together, was 11.9. And we're sitting here today trying to decide if we will give 3 or 5%. We all know the struggles that our community members have faced and the retirees on a fixed income. It is, it is even more of a struggle for them. So in the past eight years, Social Security has given an increase of 25.8% to keep up with inflation because of how things have been going. We, in six years, gave a total of 5.5% increase. With historical, potentially 17 years prior to that, hardly giving anything. So I will stand here and I will always fight for our retirees and I feel sort of ashamed that this is how um, these COLAs have gone and they were not kept up with in previous years prior to this, um, prior to at least me being on the council. So I, I can wait, but I will sit <laughs> I'm just going to say when this motion comes back to the floor, I will not be voting for a 3%. I will wait and I will vote on the main motion of a 5% increase for these retirees. And I will stand by my vote. Thank you. Councilor Green, do you have something to say? Oh, I didn't want to interrupt. No, go ahead. Um, I just want to say if we do uh, postpone, I just need really clear direction because I've heard a lot of different asks and thoughts about what information might be needed. So I just will need it spelled out very clearly. I agree with you because there are certain things that I am not in favor of. I don't think we need another actuarial investigation and looking at numbers. So Councilor Parker, you had requested some items. We're going to do a consensus on what we would like the um, town staff to bring forward to us. What were the items you were looking for, please? As I stated them and didn't write them down, we'll have to go back and review the tape. Can we review the tape? Thank you. Okay, Councilor McBride, what were you looking for? Thank you. I'm looking for more information on to show to show the compounding effect on those numbers. So if we're gonna increase 200,000, how that relates to the, fo the following year, and the following year after that, and how that's gonna impact the bill rate. I'd also like to see, even if it's not individual, if we're not able to provide that, what the range of the pension salaries are so we can get a feeling of what the need is for that individual, um, for those amounts, so we can see what these retirees are receiving. Um, so mainly just the financial ramifications of, of the various options. And for us to truly understand what that, you know, what that 3.6 or $3.4 million liability is going to do to the town and its financial stability. I'm, I'm having a difficult time hearing you, and you're saying a lot of things, so I'm trying to break it out to exactly so we can take a consensus of each bullet point to see if the council is looking for this in general, because they're going to have to do work to get us this. And, we, and they work for the council and not for one individual counselor. So I, was, I want to try and get a consensus of the council of what we were, are looking for. Can you please, in bullet points, give me the items you're looking for? Yeah, I'd like to see in ranges, the salary ranges for the current pensioners. There's usually a pension roll which lists every single individual and their salary. We don't need to see the individual names if that's doesn't desire, although it's all public information, but I'd like to see what the pensioners are receiving, because that should give at least me an understanding of how 
how needed um, this this increase is. And I'd also like to see the impact on, and I don't know, I can probably talk to John about this later, but how the impact of that $3.6 million is going to roll forward on the city's financials. I mean, I know the bond rating agencies will not look forward to a $3.6 million hit on your, on your ADEP favorably. So it's more bigger picture stuff like that. You want to know what the $3.6 million impact on the budget is? Is that what you're asking? No, $3.6 million impact on the overall financial condition of the, of the town. Well, that's, that's, for the, that's not per year, though. Um, that's over 20 yeah, years. Yeah, we would, you know, we basically have to use that base, what was it, for, and, and I assume we're talking 3% and 5% we want run. Um, that, so that like at the three percent, basically it's one hundred eighty-four thousand to start with at the three percent per year. It'll but change. That three point four million dollar liability is it's present value, so it's going to hit the balance sheet as a liability. Yes, but in terms of the budget effect, you you would look year by year, and it's going to change year by year. So it'd be a very rough. If we can do something, it'd be a rough estimate because we don't know what the actuarial will change every year. That's true too. Because I, I would based, basically, you know, we'd have to make some assumptions. I think so. it's based on market performance too. What yeah, our unfunded market, liability yeah. is. So that's kind of two moving I, targets. I think I would just take this number and carry it out. Is probably all it would do. Right. The one eighty four and the three hundred six. Yes. And I think with some assumptions, with that, that likely future councils are going to give some increases as well. So that's that's kind of the issue. It's just five percent. It's right. compounded, right? It's not. It's five percent plus two percent. Two years plus two percent. It's that's why generally it's usually only two, 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 two and two and a half because of the compounding back. And so we're looking at the long term uh, impact and how that's going to affect the budget. If you're adding, you know, whatever it is, two hundred. I forget the number. I don't know how it's probably two hundred fifty thousand dollars on this year's budget. It's going to roll into the future budget. It's going to increase the future year. I think. One thing I think about is my understanding for actuarial reviews, this is a snapshot in time, this data that we're given, assumptions and what things are going to look like. In 10 years, if we have a, a great return on the market, our unfunded liability might be reduced by X and these numbers are all different. So it's really hard to say over 20 years is 3.4 million. How is it going to hit the balance sheet every year? What is our contribution going to be according to the actuarial suggestion that's a best guess i think every year that they're doing yeah I, I think we'd have to carry that forward but then in terms of what councilman mcbride is asking we can make some assumptions on every two years giving like a two percent increase in how that adds up and market performance i don't th i don't know how you do yeah, that I, I don't think we can build that in even yeah, if you I just have the cash outlay showing how that's going to impact the future budgets would be beneficial mm. But I don't think you can tell how it's going to affect it, the budget. It, yeah, it wouldn't be real accurate. It gives you some idea of how it compounds. But on the other hand, if inflation goes down and we have 0% increases for numerous years, you might not give a coal a lot. So you can't, there's assumptions here that are very hard to make, I think. Right, very but once hard. you raise that bar, you can't change that bar. You've already raised. It's kind of like the MBR at the Board of Ed. I mean, it's, it's raised. You can't go back. So it's but I can tell you that if you looked at the history, you will see that for probably 17 years, majority of these people got no increase. So I think that was very easy to say. You saved a lot of money as the town. So, all right. I think I have your two bullet points. Councilor Gajewski, do you have any bullet points? Um, I have one. And just because I everybody we're requesting more information i would like to see what an 11.9 percent increase would be just just as say, just if we could be equal to social security so run another actuarial scenario yeah, pay, pay for actual right i mean you guys aren't going to approve that that would be sort of a waste of money to me but you know. That's why I'm writing it down. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we're taking consensus on utilizing your time, town dollars, and the such. Councilor Jones, do you have anything that you would like to? Are you able to put how many retirees are in that? How many retirees do we have? Yep. In each group? That should it's, be. It's at the it's top of the yeah. page, isn't it? Mm -hmm. oh, is it in here? 
Yeah, isn't this the one, two, three, four, five? Oh no, 10, no. 13, that's, what are those numbers? I don't know offhand, I don't wanna guess. Oh, it's, it looks like group numbers. It's um, a group number, okay. I see a clock so, on the top left. So how many retirees? Per group, yeah, we can Per group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just a question on Councilor Gajewski's number of 11.9, couldn't you just double, double the five? Yeah, that'll, that'll work too. <laughs> 306 is 60, yeah. 612 and 3.4 is 6.8. Just double the numbers, mm -hmm. 6.8 and 3. Yeah. Just Thank you, Councilor Jack. Is that, isn't actually work quite that it's way, perfect, but it's a ballpark. It's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. close enough. Yeah. yeah, it's not even half. 5% is not even half of the 11.9. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, so the number of people in each group, that's my question, that's my yeah, that's Councilor Pacino, do you have any questions that you would like them to work out before we um, join? No, I was all set to vote for five right <laughs> now, so I'm good. Me too. Council Bordelon. Um, I think most of the things have been discussed. Um, I just think it would, it allows me to do some more research too and look at numbers on my own. And, um, and I think it, one of the things I did have was how many um, employees were being affected, but that was already asked, so that's, that's fine. Councilor Parker, we are going to try and do this. I'm trying to recall the items that you had asked for. Um, I think it was some t something to do with salaries of increase in salaries. Is that what, was that correct? I have age range and which departments are affected, but not the names. Okay, so we have the number of retirees per group and I'm sorry, say one more thing. Uh, I had notes for Councillor Parker age range and which department's affected, so I'm not sure if I captured everything with those two notes. All right. And Councillor Parker, do you recall if you had asked for um, something to do with salaries that increased, our increase in salaries and how that would affect pensions in the future? I did. I did ask that. All right. But I believe you stated that it, it would be normal or what it was. Ms. It, Green, it I believe that's what Ms. Green stated. Any increase in the was just a small group. This is it was $19, 11 people. Yeah, it was like $19,000. Yeah, not everybody, I think, was pen, in the pension. And okay. Can I ask a question? What's that? Go ahead. I believe there's one group that doesn't pay Social Security. How does that factor in? Factor into what? It, it, that isn't get plugged in. I don't think it gets plugged into any of those. Right, things. It's a factor you can consider. Yeah, this is about the the valuation of the pension dollars. Um, Social Security okay. would not be part of that. Well. It, but there's one group that's not, okay, never mind. I'll ask later. I know what I'm saying, but. Okay. Pension, because this evening was mentioned about Social Security and what they pay out. But there's okay. a group that do not pay into Social Security. Or two, yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's a couple that don't pay into it. Mm -hmm. And do they get the same equal amount of an increase. Unless you change the motion, yes. Okay. But I did have to put that question, state, state that out there. There are two groups that don't pay Social Security. But by the way, guys, we were supposed to ask about the 10 o'clock and it's, 11, it's almost 11 o'clock. Right. So I'm hoping we can close this out soon. Yes, I'm trying to work on that. I would like um, my request to be that you also include in our packet the cost of living COLA information for 2024, which also it's from the Social Security Department that gives the breakdown of all the increases that they have historically had so that counselors can compare the increases that Social Security has given versus what we have given. And if you could do that in a, some kind of spreadsheet would be lovely. So it's um, Social Security increases versus town. All right, so we're gonna go through these. I just have something. I'm just going to, it's, 
I'm going to go through these. We are going to raise our hand and say if we are in favor of them, if we get five to support it, this will be a direction. And if you do not get five of support, we're not asking for you to follow up on this information. Then we will take a motion on the postpone, and then you will know the direction of what you need to give for the postponement. Council Bordelon. Um, I could just reach out to the unions, but I was just gonna ask if, you know, is this, um, I would just like to know, is this an ask from the union across the board if they're looking for 5%? Uh, yeah, I and believe all of their letters said five. They did say five, but it's, is that the ask they're doing across the board in all the towns? Some towns might not even give colas. No, I meant so, the ones that do. I mean, I'd I can have to reach research. Out. Yeah. That was one of my asks. I, I'm just going to ask if you talk, you know, like, Got it. you talk okay. to. I can reach out to them too. I mean, I don't mind, but that was one of my other things I wanted to add. Was, okay. Are, is that their kind of, you know, because they, as a. All right, I'm going union, to take a. We're going to do this because I understand you're I trying to explain it, but we don't have, we are, you don't have the, the floor. Your time has been expired. No, we had a different we motion. Are, I still haven't no. returned. No. We are trying to go through this, and, and I understand you're trying to explain yourself, but let's That's just fine. get through this. I'm, I'm fine. Thank, you. Thank you. So one is to ask for a range salary for the current pensioners. Is there anybody in favor of that? I'm, I'm in favor of that, but I, I just have a point of clarification. I'm not sure what point it is, but I, I understand what you do are coming up a direction, but when I do my due diligence, and review this i'm still i still may have questions and i may reach out to john burt for further information i just want to make sure i'm okay to do that because th this You're is right. what the council wants but i may have some additional questions so i just want to make put that on record that it may we can ask some further questions but i would say the problem with that it opens up for everybody to throw in i think if you have questions we either need to be asked tonight to look it up or else you'll have to try to make a motion or postpone if you're not satisfied for next time The next item is a rough estimate with assumptions, 3% and a 5%, I guess, a forecasted assumption. You, you understand what that means, Mr. Burt? Yeah, I understand. What was the prior item, or did you, are you reading them all, or are you doing the vote oh, after wait. each, or? The range for salary of the current pensioners had five supporters. Now we are going to go on the rough estimate with assumptions at 3% and 5%, I guess, future out up to 20 years of some sort. That's fine. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. One, two, three, four, five. You got five on that one. Councilor Gajewski, do you want me to read yours? I, I don't need it. Just Thank you. <laughs> Um, how many retirees per group? Sure. sure. You have at least five on that one. The age range of the entire, uh, retirees. Aye. Aye. You have two on that one. That one is not going to, you do not need to go forward with that. Salary increase per pe versus pension. What is that? Yeah. It was the that, salary increases for the town that we gave versus how it would affect pension. Oh, the 11 people? Yeah. Got it. I am in favor of all more information, so I'm an eye for everything. There's three people. Yeah. That one does not um, go forward. Social security increase versus what town increases were historically. I. That has five. Just, what, can I throw the caveat that there's two groups that don't have that? So I, that it, would be It's a not item. about whether they received it, Social Security. It's about comparing what we were doing versus Social Security because Social Security increases on the cost index, which shows inflation. So that's what you're uh, looking at Social Security token, to see. There's, two groups, there's a bunch of groups that don't pay into it. So it, it's, gonna, it's gonna skew the number. That's not the point of looking at that number. It's looking at Social Security to say they have given a COLA increase to people because they they compare it to the consumer, the, um, what the heck is it called? Price consumer price index. And that's usually what a COLA is based on. So we, 
randomly choose how to give a, a, a COLA increase, Social Security does it by the Consumer Price Index. Okay, can, it, all right. It's not versus special. whether they, they have Social Security or not. It's just basically saying, this is what the average that you can compare to versus what we have done in the, historically. That's all. A point of clarification. Yes. Point of information. Is Councilor Borderline in the meeting or out of the meeting? Because either she's left at 9.55 or she is part of this meeting. And I just want to make sure the record is clear. You mean 10.59? 10.59. 10 10 Sorry. Councilor Borderline is standing on the audience. I'm not sure if she's participating. All right, so our next. Uh, I stepped away because I feel like I'm being treated unfairly and unjust. So I, uh, that's I a quorum so. order. This so is I not a debatable. Councilor Bordelon, you do not have the floor. Councilor Bordelon, you do not have the floor. And she, I, I guess, has left the meeting at like 10.55, let's just say. Thank you very much. Um, so you have th four items to come forward with. Do you agree? I have range for salary for current pensioners, rough estimate of assumptions, three to 5% over 20 years, how many retirees per group, and Social Security increase percentages versus Town of Broughton historical percentages. Thank you, I appreciate that. So we currently have a motion to postpone on the floor. Oh, mm, I remember what the other item was, I'm so sorry. Okay. Go ahead, hurry up. <laughs> I wanted to list the numbers from 2006 on up. What the range were, what the percentage increase were if per group, if they had any at all. Yeah, that would fall under the Social Security increase versus the town increase. The historical, that's how I The historical it. one, yeah. yeah okay. That would fall that's under that one. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to postpone, made by Parker, seconded by McBride. Um, to April 23rd. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. That passes seven to zero to zero. Motion. Motion to adjourn. Next on the motion is other, um, I'm sorry, seven. Motion to adjourn. Adjourned by Parker. Second. Seconded by Gajewski. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. That passes seven to zero to zero. Thank you. 1102. Okay, thank you. 1102, thank you. Recording stopped.